use that second to check that you can see my screen. Can you see it? Yep. And can you go just go down one slide just to make sure that? Yeah, yeah, that's working. Okay, Very are good. we good to go, Wefet? Well, um, ready or not, let's go. Okay. <laughs> Uh, okay, thank you. Um, it, the, the outline of the paper has an introduction and a brief history, and then I try to go through like all the details of who's the participants and the quoting conventions and, and collateral and stuff like that um, in section three. Um, I'm going to assume that everybody more or less knows this stuff as much as they need to, so I'm going to focus on section four here, which is just equilibrium in the federal funds market. I'll emphasize in particular the differences before and after 2008 because the market just completely changes across 2008. So it's, it's two different markets, really. Um, and then if there's time, I'll talk about the federal funds market going forward. Okay, but I, I kind of doubt that. All right, so typically when you see people talk about the federal funds market, they'll draw a diagram like this, which is sort of a demand for reserves. So um, let's, if you can see my mouse here, they'll typically draw a demand for reserves. Uh, here's an example from this Fed's paper by Irig Senyas and Weinbach. Um, I'm actually gonna draw slightly different diagrams. I'm gonna do the diagrams in terms of supply and demand for federal funds loans up here. So I'm gonna draw a, a demand curve for loans, which is downward sloping and a supply curve of loans, which is upward sloping. Okay, so that's actually gonna help you illustrate, it's gonna help illustrate a lot of the things I'm gonna talk about a lot better than that other diagram does. So, so just bear with me on that. Okay, so here's the standard equilibrium in the federal funds market before 2008. You have here, um, uh, there's a downward sloping demand for federal funds. I have here on the vertical axis, the federal funds rate in the market. On the horizontal axis here, I have the quantity of federal funds lending. Okay, so this is not the quantity of reserves, it's the quantity of loans that are made in the market on a typical day before 2008. Okay, so on a typical day before 2008, higher Fed funds rate, less demand to borrow, um, and a higher Fed funds rate, there would be more supply of loans, the more people interested in lending federal funds. Okay. So the interesting, you know, you, you have this downward sloping demand, this upward sloping supply, it's sort of truncated at the top because here is RD, which is the Fed's discount rate. Um, and abstracting from stigma for the moment, right, then presumably nobody would demand a loan at an interest rate above the discount rate because they would then just switch and borrow directly from the Fed. So the demand for loans actually sort of gets truncated up at the top here. Similarly, the supply of loans becomes essentially infinite um, because what would happen is if the federal funds rate tried to be higher than the discount rate, um, banks would go out, they'd borrow from the Fed and then land in the open market and collect the arbitrage profits on the difference. So you'd end up with an infinite demand um, an infinite supply of federal funds loans and an infinite demand from the discount window to conduct that arbitrage, okay? Now, obviously stigma um, and, uh, is gonna prevent people from pursuing that perfectly. So you're gonna end up with actually somewhere that's in between these two lines. So you get maybe a, a decreased demand, uh, but in theory, the, the demand for federal funds and supply of federal funds would be truncated like in this diagram. And that's essentially the equilibrium before 2008, okay? Um, there's essentially no floor except at zero. So now several things change in 2008, beginning in 2008. So first, the Fed began paying interest on reserves in October 2008. Second, the Fed increased the quantity of reserves by an enormous amount, a factor of about 60 from 2008 to 2014 due to large scale asset purchases. And the Dodd-Frank Act required the FDIC to begin charging banks fees on their total assets rather than just their deposits um, beginning in 2011 or actually or, or gradually being implemented starting in 2011. Okay, and so that actually changes the market too, as, as I'll discuss. So here's sort of the theoretical equilibrium. Let's just focus for a minute on the case where the Fed is now going to pay interest on reserves. And here's in theory what a lot of people expected the equilibrium to look like once that happened. So the top of the diagram is exactly the same as before. There's this discount rate up here. Nobody would borrow or lend um, at rates above the discount rate. But now the bottom of the diagram is truncated as well because down here, nobody would supply a federal funds loan at an interest rate below 
what the Fed is paying, which is here the R on the interest on excess reserves, the interest rate on excess reserves. Okay, so there because again, if, if the federal funds rate tried to be lower than that, then everybody would just all these banks would just deposit their money at the Fed instead, collect R I O E R um, rather than earn the lower return in the federal funds market. So you get this truncation. Um, a federal funds rates uh, that could not happen below R, I, O, E, R. And then on the other side, there would be an infinite demand for federal funds loans uh, at interest rates below the I, O, E, R rate because banks would want to conduct um, I, O, E, R arbitrage that they would go out and borrow in the federal funds market at this lower interest rate and then go take that uh, loan that they got deposited at the Fed and earn the R, I, O, E, R rate. Um, and earn the spread on the difference between the two. It's a, a perfect arbitrage. So you get a truncation now below as well as above. The equilibrium federal funds rate here, RFF star, would lie somewhere in between the discount rate and the IOER rate, and the quantity of federal funds would be um, at this corresponding part here. Okay, so now that equilibrium didn't happen, as I think everybody on this uh, Zoom call knows. Um, and because some institutional details complicate that diagram in practice. So in particular, the government-sponsored enterprises, the Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and actually it, it turns out the federal home loan banks are primarily the large suppliers in this market. Um, they're large suppliers of federal funds and they are not eligible to receive the interest on reserves from the Federal Reserve. So they, do, they are not bound by that floor. And then the second thing to keep in mind is there's this fee from the FDIC, as I mentioned, on total assets, which now makes this IOER arbitrage prohibitively costly for most US domestic banks. So they're not going to do um, what you would think they would do in theory. Um, however, US branches of foreign banks are exempt from the FDIC fee. So they can conduct IOE arbitrage profitably. So the diagram is actually gonna look more like this in practice. The top of the diagram is still the same as before. We sort of have this discount rate acting as a ceiling. Okay, and now what's going on, and so here's the IOER rate, which I had before, which is gonna act as a little bit, you know, it's, it, that, that would be what was the floor before, but now it's not gonna effectively be a floor anymore. And, and so here's some of the features. So um, what happens is as the federal funds rate begins to approach the IOER rate, when it hits the IOER rate, um, banks no longer, here so I can see this. Okay. Uh, US banks will no longer, actually, no banks will supply loans at interest rates below the IOER rate. Banks will not because they can just earn the IOER rate from the Fed. So, this you get this discrete drop in the supply of federal funds loans in the Fed funds market um, because banks all leave, the, banks all exit the private market. They just deposit their funds directly at the Fed. But the GSEs will continue to supply loans at rates below the IOER rate. So you get this discrete drop in the quantity of lending, the quantity of supply in the market, but then it begins to fall gradually again because the GSEs will still supply loans, but as the Fed funds rate falls, they supply less and less, okay. Um, then on the other side here, right, there's this, the IOER arbitrage does not, you do not get this flat line. There's no infinite demand for arbitrage if, if the funds rate falls by up below IOER, but you do this increased demand, um, which is the US branches of the foreign banks conducting IOER arbitrage, but the demand is not infinite. You know, although they do not face regulatory constraints or costs from the FDIC, they do face some regulatory restrictions from their home uh, regulatory authorities. And so there is demand for these arbitrage profits, but it is not infinite. So you get this demand for federal funds loans that increases once the Fed funds rate falls below IOER. Um, but it, it is not infinite. And so you end up with an equilibrium that's more like here, the equilibrium federal funds rate is actually end, ends up somewhat below the IOER rate and the quantity of federal funds is, is at this point here. Okay, so the market looks like that. The final technical um, thing to talk about in the market is this Fed's reverse repurchase facility. That began in 2014. Um, the Fed has stood ready to borrow federal funds in the market at this set, what's essentially a set overnight reverse repurchase rate. Everyone is eligible, including the GSEs. In fact, this policy was specifically targeted to give the GSEs a way to earn interest on their reserves. So the ONRRP rate effectively provides a floor for the equilibrium federal funds rate that was missing. If I go back to the diagram here, 
right? There's no floor on the federal funds rate. The floor is zero because the GSEs will potentially supply funds all the way down to zero. And if the arbitrage does not soak it all up, you can get the federal funds rate being arbitrarily close to zero. Okay, so now the ONRRP rate will provide a floor. And so you get a diagram that looks like this. So now here, here's the R, uh, the ONRRP rate down here. The top of the diagram is exactly the same as in the previous slide. So you get again, there's this discrete drop off where banks will not supply loans once the Fed funds rate drops below IOER. And now GSEs, no one, including the GSEs, will supply loans once the Fed funds rate were, tries to drop below the ONRRP rate. So now you get this discrete drop off to zero because literally no one is willing to lend at an interest rate below the RRP rate because they can just get that by lending directly to the Fed instead. Um, over here, you have uh, US branches of foreign banks conducting IOER arbitrage just as before. And in fact, if the federal funds rate were to try to fall below the ONRRP rate, then even the GSEs could conduct arbitrage. They would conduct ONRRP arbitrage by borrowing in the market and lending to the Fed at the ONRRP rate. Okay, so you get an equilibrium diagram that looks like this. Now, because of this flat line here, no matter how the supply of Fed funds loans shift outward, left or right, no matter how the demand shifts inward or outward, left or right, the equilibrium Fed funds rate is bounded um, below by ONRRP. There's a floor here, effectively here, because of this horizontal segment. Okay, so the equilibrium federal funds rate is now bounded below by ONRRP. It's bounded above for sure, in theory, by the discount rate, um, and in practice, typically by the IOER rate, um, given how large it's, uh, the supply of Fed funds loans is. Okay, so here's a contrast um, of the equilibrium in the federal funds market before and after 2008. So in the old days, banks borrowed Fed funds to meet their reserve requirements. Um, nowadays, banks have abundant reserves, okay? There's, they're awash with reserves, so they never need to borrow to meet their reserve requirements. Um, banks and GSEs with excess reserves would lend Fed funds to earn interest on those reserves. Nowadays, Essentially, all federal funds loans are provided by the GSEs. Essentially, no banks provide Fed funds loans in the market anymore. Um, and then banks in need of reserves used to borrow those reserves to meet their reserve requirements. Nowadays, essentially, all Fed funds borrowing is entirely by U.S. branches of foreign banks who are conducting IOER arbitrage. So the market is very, very different. The, the, the borrowers are different. The lenders are different. The purpose of the federal funds market is now completely different. It's no longer to meet reserve requirements. The purpose of the market is only to conduct arbitrage. That, that's the only trading that's going on now. Um, so uh, the Fed used to hit its Fed funds rate target by varying the quantity of total reserves, increasing or decreasing the quantity of reserves to shift supply and demand for loans outward and inward and hit the, the target federal funds rate. That's no longer the case. Now the Fed hits the Fed funds rate target, not by adjusting the quantity of reserves, but just by varying the administered, the directly administered interest rates, which are the discount rate, the IOER rate, and the overnight reverse repurchase rate. These are the rates the Fed sets directly, and that's how they control the federal funds rate. Okay. And so large, in the old days, large financial institutions would cause other short-term interest rates to track the Fed funds rate by arbitrage. Today, that's mostly the same. Large financial institutions cause other short-term interest rates to track the IOER and ONRRP rates by arbitrage. Okay. And again, that arbitrage is not perfect because of these FDIC fees, but it, nevertheless, the forces are there that if, if these other short-term money market rates tried to deviate, um, there, there still is this force that's gonna keep them from deviating too far from the IOER and ONRRP rates. Um, here's a diagram from that paper I mentioned, IRIG, Senyas, and Weinbach, which basically just shows as the Fed was raising interest rates in 2015 and 16 and 17, you know, there, the, the dash line at the bottom here is the ONRRP rate. The dotted line at the top of the range is the interest on reserves rate and other money market rates, the SOFR, for instance, which is the measure of repo rates. Um, that's basically tracking along. Um, with the Fed's target. And that's, that's entirely coming through arbitrage. The Fed does not target SOFR directly. That's just following by arbitrage from large financial institutions. And then when they were cutting rates, the same thing happens. So you see the pass through right there. Okay, how much time do I have? Uh, I maybe a minute. Two minutes, two minutes. Yeah. So I'll just say for a minute, um, going forward, the FOMC has stated that it will continue to communicate monetary policy in terms of a federal funds rate target. 
So we should expect that going forward, even though the market's very different, they're still gonna communicate in terms of the federal funds rate target. Reserves will continue to be abundant, they have said. Um, so they're not, gonna, they're not gonna go back to the old days where they would increase and decrease the supply of reserves. They're just gonna target everything using the uh, administered interest rates regime that they've set up. They're gonna move the ONRRP rate, the IOER rate, and the discount rate and target short-term interest rates that way. Um, in principle, this is sort of an interesting thing to think about because other central banks have all set negative money market rates um, in their home countries. Uh, the Fed has not done that, but they could um, by setting the ONRRP rate negative and setting the IOER rate negative. And you also have to charge GSEs a fee for holding Fed funds. You can't, you can't, um, uh, you know, if you're going to charge banks a fee, if you're going to make the IOER rate negative, you have to charge the GSEs a fee also. Um, but if you set all of these things negative, then you can end up with a negative equilibrium federal funds rate too. Um, large financial institutions would then drive other short-term interest rates negative by arbitrage, just like in those diagrams I showed you on the last slide. Okay, so the Fed could achieve a negative interest rate um, relatively easily. So again, here's the outline of, of what's in the paper. Um, and that's, and without going, I, I skipped over some of the details in these other parts of the paper, but, but that summarizes what I had. Great, thank you very much. So Ben is going to discuss this chapter. Great, thank you. Well, let's uh, screen here. Okay, is my screen visible? Let's cycle through. Yep. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Well, thank you uh, for letting me discuss this paper. I really enjoyed it, or this uh, this chapter on the Fed funds market. I'll try to also adhere to um, time. So. Um, a lot of things that this paper or this chapter made me think about, uh, I think a lot of the paper focuses or the chapter focuses on how the uh, Fed runs rate is determined pre and post 2008. I thought that was very helpful. I have a couple suggestions of kind of how I think um, uh, it could be easier to absorb as a, as a book chapter, but generally just also some kind of context uh, questions or things that I enjoyed kind of uh, uh, thinking about it. So one thing I noticed is um, the paper talks a lot about the uneven participation and the multiple rates that interact with the Fed funds market. So we have um, U.S. depository institutions who acted as previously as a borrower and a lender, and they were the original kind of users of the market, a reason the market existed, uh, but they've uh, really seem to have left the market, okay, because the Fed increased uh, Fed funds uh, or the supply by 60 times. There's just not really a lot for them to do. Additionally, they have a lot of reserves on their own. So um, the remainder in the market is now really the GSEs as a lender, um, and then the U.S. branches of foreign banks as a borrower and a lender. And uh, as Eric said in his uh, discussion of the chapter, it seems like a lot of the activity now is uh, due to arbitrage between the foreign banks and the GSEs, so, um, or taking advantage of the GSEs, you could say. Uh, the Fed is operating as a borrower and a lender. Uh, really just to enforce their corridor interest rate policy. And um, I thought uh, you know, it kind of seems like you could say that they're setting a price or they're setting really just a very sizable eight and a half trillion dollar bid and ask at the discount rate and the ONRP rate. You could think of uh, as their total amount of securities holdings is the maximum they could pledge in this reverse repo facility. So these are our four players. One of them has kind of left the market. And then we have four rates. So we have the federal funds rate, which is the federal funds or the Fed's target rate. And then we have the kind of old floor, which is IOER, uh, the interest on excess reserves. We have a, the ceiling, the discount rate. And then we have the new floor, which is this reverse repo or ONRRP. So one thing I thought would just be helpful or might condense some of the discussion is, is even just, this lends itself very well to a table form presentation. So a simple table of who are the participants, what are their roles, um, what do they do uh, then and now? And then what are the rates in the market? Um, might, might help just, it helped for me because I just wrote it down to make sure I understood everything exactly how you presented it. And then a lot of the paper dwells on what happened since 2008, um, uh, talking about uh, the large scale asset purposes, purchases the FDIC's asset charge, and then the ONRRP program. Um, I, as a, just as, as a comment, I thought it'd be helpful to mention also this um, which you mentioned in your talk, this kind of post-September 2019 ample reserves regime that the Fed has kind of committed to that 
Um, not only are they going to do these large scale asset purchases, but they're going to target abundant reserves at all banks. Uh, and so uh, kind of a commitment that going forward, banks will not need to return to this market. And so um, uh, the um, uh, IOER and then ONRP becoming a broader floor for money market rates, um, really changing the structure of the market. I thought that might be a relevant inclusion uh, as well. This post, post the repo market shock in September, 2019, that's change in, in policy. Uh, my comments, Main comment is really about uh, the kind of the, the thesis of the pay, of the chapter or the feeling I got from it, which is really how relevant is the Fed funds market today, and how much how do we think about how the Fed funds market matters uh, for the real economy? And then I have some minor or additional comments. Um, so uh, I'll skip the the technical comments for for later in the interest of time. So um, how relevant in terms of are there related markets that we should think about? Um, uh, I know. Uh, there are a lot of international markets for many of the other types of chapters, but the Fed market is the Fed funds market is U.S. specific. But are there kind of international counterparts like the overnight euro dollar market that I should think of if I'm trying to study as a researcher what is affecting the dynamics of of Fed funds? You mentioned that you know a big player is uh, foreign U.S. foreign banks with U.S. Um, uh, branches, and is something could something from the euro dollar market or some other short term funding market kind of uh, ricochet into the Fed funds market dynamics. Uh, and additionally, other Fed funds products, so for example, futures and options. Uh, are these a different class of market participants that I should add to my table of you know, the, the uneven participants I mentioned earlier, or with different kind of trading incentives that affects their dynamics? And uh, is there any interaction to the two, or can I kind of just ignore uh, these, these other derivative products? Um, and then uh, additionally onto that SOFA, which you mentioned in your talk today, is replacing LIBOR and the Fed funds markets is shrinking. So um, in your futures, I'd like to hear, when you're thinking about future policy from the Fed, do you think it's viable for SOFA to be a replacement for the Fed funds target rate altogether? Or is it, uh, uh, why, why not? Um, uh, and then uh, in terms of systemic risk of, uh, the, the Fed funds, uh, clearly the Fed funds market was changed dramatically by post 2008 interventions. Um, and I feel like from your reading your chapter that you feel like it was kind of destroyed and then reduced to just an arbitrage mechanism. So uh, was the Fed funds market or researchers explored whether Fed funds was kind of an innocent bystander in 2008 that kind of got obliterated by other forces or is there some weakness in Fed funds itself like in repo that caused some systemic financial instability? Uh, or in, in general, can anything ever go wrong in this market? Can there be runs on individual borrowers or things that uh, might promote additional regulation or have promoted the Fed to really displace this market? Um, uh, I just had a couple of minor questions about uh, maybe uh, the um, viability of the, the uh, Fed funds market going forward. First of all, you mentioned in the paper the the convenience and efficiency of conducting interbank transactions via Fed funds uh, are so large that there will always be a market for Fed funds, even at very negative interest rates. I thought it'd be very helpful here uh, to talk about what transactions still occur besides arbitrage at deeply negative rates. I had a hard time thinking of um, anything besides just simple uh, settlement needs that that uh, would cause a bank to transact in this market, and so. You know, we're expecting something like, you know, five transactions a day going forward in the Fed funds market outside of arbitrage purposes, or is there kind of still going to be some sizable fraction of the market that is serving legitimately banking purposes? Uh, and then um, I thought it would be helpful, given all the attention here in your chapter about post-2008 activity, uh, on a commentary about the value of uh, foreign bank activity in this market. Is this, has this evolved simply to what you might even call a parasitic market where um, foreign banks are arbitraging off of trapped uh, government agencies. In other words, you know, could we quantify how much US taxpayers have delivered to foreign banks via GSEs who are trapped and the Fed who is offering this arbitrage opportunity? Uh, and does this structure contribute to the Fed's mission? Should we still have a Fed funds market um, and this arbitrage or is this simply giving away millions of dollars to foreign banks every year. I don't know, but the tone of the paper reads like um, that the, the future of the Fed funds market is, is currently parasitic and maybe should be stopped. And I think uh, it lends itself well to maybe a bit of short discussion on, on this, this point explicitly rather than implicitly. Um, I think I'm trying to stay under time here. So 
Uh, there's a bit more technical comments I can make, but I think a lot of very helpful market details, uh, very well structured. I like the equilibrium analysis pre and post 2008. I think some summary tables would be very helpful for that. Um, a bit of, of quantification of how big the market is in terms of size pre-2008, size post-2008, as well as um, the, the dollar value of this arbitrage opportunity would, I think, help understand the um, uh, economic relevance of this market. And then uh, I think there's a bit of wider scope in terms of other products or related markets to understand the research context. So should I study this as a standalone market or think about international markets given the arbitrage internationally happening? Uh, and it's, it's well written and it reads quickly and leaves the reader wanting to know more. So I um, enjoyed it very much and I'll stop there. I think I'm under time. So thank you very much. And that'll thank you, ben. We'll thank save you, additional ben. comments for um, being offline. I'll start with a couple of questions or really comments. In the, in the part about negative Fed funds rates, I believe that there's ambiguity about the legal position of the Fed's authority to set negative rates there, and that would be worth discussing. And the Fed has, as you say, switched to a model of really using two floors on the Fed funds rate with both IOER and overnight reverse repo. Uh, it would be interesting to talk a little bit about the magnitude of reserves that you need to control the Fed funds rate with that model. So presumably it's something a little bigger than we had in September 2019. Um, Angelo, you had a question. Yes, uh, two points. One is maybe easy or more semantic, which is, a, would you call it a, a more segmented market before 2008 and 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 then less so, because then um, the GAC can uh, somehow repair the, 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 the access to the services. So what's, uh, because you never mentioned the, the, the term segmentation, I was a bit surprised. The second point, which is more substantial to me, is that uh, I like a lot your uh, diagram, demand supply, and so on. I also use something similar. Um, myself, but it's really, you know, hinges on demand and supply of resources. There is nothing about demand and supply of collateral. So maybe I'm, I'm not so familiar with the US, but in the Europe, that, the collateral is, is, is driving, the, driving the whole story. The collateral is the king. Um, and since we have a heterogeneity in collateral assets, several sovereign bonds, uh, with different default risk and so on. This also create dispersion in the repo rates, in the money market rates and so on. And this play a huge role. Um, yeah, if you can maybe explain me why you, you haven't mentioned the, the collateral. Oreste. Uh, thank you. Uh, no, just two quick uh, comments, questions. Uh, Eric, maybe you already go uh, 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 discuss this. Uh, more in the in the chapter, but uh, I think uh, you know what, what one question is why two floors. Uh, so, or, or if you wish, what are the considerations that determines uh, you know the spread between the two you know the, the interest on reserves and this uh, ONRP rate? Even you know maybe you know, both from a practical perspective at the Fed and and uh, you know is is there a theory that we can we can appeal to for for determining them? And the other one is there any evidence about um, you know what determines the, what the short end of the of the term structure is it more going towards the the interest on reserves or does it fall uh, towards the ONRP rate? With that, you're muted. So in, yes. Uh, so interest on reserves is an administrative rate that the Fed obviously chooses, and it's an interesting thought to think a little bit about the distributional consequences. Right, because uh, in the end, it's a transfer to the financial sector from everybody else. And um, you know, one choice might have been, if you didn't want to penalize the banks for holding so much reserves, to say interest on reserves is whatever the Fed funds rate is. Um, but we don't do that, right? We set a separate administrative rate. It helps in monetary policy administration some, uh, but at a cost. And I think that's worth pointing out. Andreas? Yes, thanks. Um, yeah, just wanted to quickly point out, um, you know, also the, um, 
um, you know, the the use of reserves basically um, from a regulatory point of view. So, I mean, for the purposes of LCR, et cetera, um, you know, that could change the shape of these demand curves as well for reserve balances. And maybe that's also something to consider for thinking about the post uh, GFC environment because of all the re liquidity regulation, et cetera. So, so I would encourage uh, Eric maybe to, to discuss that a bit more in the paper. And then the, the other thing would be, um, about the skewness as well in the reserve balances, which in turn also may create these distributional frictions as reserves may need to get relo relocated through the system, whether that's in um, in the federal funds market or the repo market. But um, I think we have seen quite a bit of these uh, frictions at play, for example, in some of the uh, the turbulence that we've seen, for example, in 2019. And, and some of it might be due to the very skewed, uh, you know, distributional reserves in the system. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Just so in thinking the interests of keeping on schedule, could Eric, could you respond by chat rather than, uh, unless this is, is this, if there's one very urgent thing you want to say, but otherwise I'd prefer if you could do it by chat. Let me say one thing, which is okay. um, uh, there, there's still, I, I kind of realize maybe I should add this in my discussion in the chapter that I, I've really focused in the chapter on federal funds loans um, and and this this idea that maybe the federal funds loans maybe is, is sort of a, a weird market now, but there, there's still a lot of use of federal funds itself and federal funds transactions like between banks. This came up in Ben's discussion, right? I mean, there's enormous quantities of federal funds bouncing back and forth between banks for settlement and clearing purposes. So the mark the, the federal funds sort of settlement transactions are still extremely, extremely valuable, even if the loans is sort of this weird market now. So I, I should I should clarify that in the chapter for sure. I'll respond to the others by chat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we move on now to Ben, who's talking about the repo market. Okay, thanks. Uh, happy to talk about uh, the repo market. So um, I will try to uh, cover briefly the topics of my, my chapter or in summary form here and, and welcoming any comments or things. I know there's there's a lot to talk about in the his, in the uh, story of the repo markets. So um, uh, comments on what can be added or subtracted are very, very welcome. Uh, so I'll start off with talking about a bit of intro or history of the repo market just to give some context to its kind of uh, history of innovation. And I think that we should welcome uh, the structure of a repo, how a repo contract is priced. Um, some considerations and why we see sometimes volatility in repo pricing, uh, some related products for repo, what markets repo uh, trading uh, exist uh, across the world, um, and then uh, fragility of repo markets in, in a, and regulation of those markets in a broad sense. So uh, this is not to be uh, give every technical detail, but hopefully a good introduction for uh, the main factors of a repo market. So. I mentioned in the chapter, the invention of the repo market it was invented by the Fed as a regulatory arbitrage. Now the context of, of it was a, a kind of a end of November 20, or 1917 regulation that threatened to destroy the commercial paper market. And uh, bankers were rushing to liquidate all of their bankers acceptance notes and the Fed found a loophole uh, because of their constraint that unlike European central banks, they couldn't buy commercial paper from other banks without a discount. Uh, they found this loophole that they could buy the banks without uh, holding them to maturity with their agreement to resell the, the uh, securities. And so they avoided this uh, regulation and created these resale agreements, which later became called repurchase agreements. Uh, so we shouldn't be surprised. They're born out of innovation and they, the Fed continues to innovate there. Um, the uh, repo serves traditionally a purpose of facilitating securities trading. And a lot of times firms that get into issues are blowing up their repo uh, books or repo runs, as we call them when we talk about systemic risk, is because they're using them not for short-term trading, but for long-term financing. But really, uh, repo's traditional purpose is for trading securities. And uh, innovation and reform typically follows a blow-up in some type of a repo borrower's event. Um, so what is the structure of a repo? It's, it's, it's got some few, a few key features and then a lot of variations on it. There's a cash borrower and a cash lender. And then there is collateral that is exchanged for this cash. And sometimes the collateral is the key. And in some markets, like in Europe, collateral is the key, and sometimes cash is, financing is the is the key uh, to that transaction or the driver motivating the transaction. Every repo contract has a start and an end date. Usually, it starts the same day as it's negotiated. 
Uh, there's some rate that's due at uh, maturity and it can be negative. There's some collateral that's pledged uh, as security against default or maybe as the, the target you're trying to acquire is collateral rather than cash. Uh, and then there's some haircut, which is a protection against default by the cash lender. Uh, on a longer maturity repo, this is very similar to initial and variation margin you'd see in other products. Uh, importantly, the economic benefits of changes in collateral value accrue to the cash borrower. So if you pledge the security and it pays a dividend or pays coupons that um, accrues to the, the economic value accrues to the cash borrower who provided the security. Okay. An example repo transaction very simply is a dealer wants to finance their trading inventory. They have um, 10 million notional of five-year U.S. treasuries to repo out. And the GC or the one repo market uh, investor offers a 1.57% repo rate with zero haircuts. So this just offers some conventions in the market. The dealer will pledge using the dirty price or the market value today, including coupons, which might be uh, above or below that notional amount of 10 million. So in this case, 9.9 .9 million. The cash lender is going to trans, uh, transfer the haircutted amount of that market price or dirty value of the bond. Um, and then at maturity, then the dealer or the dealer who borrows cash will buy back their treasuries uh, for uh, principal plus interest. And that interest is accrued on a on a day count as it is as is common in uh, money markets. So one day divided by 360 days in a trading year times the interest rate. And so the total interest in this case for a cash lender would be uh, the difference of $434 of interest. OK. Uh, the way that we talk about repo in the market typically is uh, repo and reverse repo are just two sides of the same transaction. So repo would be what we call the cash in leg, where you are pledging a security and receiving a cash. Your counterparty would call that uh, where they're receiving a security and, and leaving uh, cash is leaving their institution, institution. For them, that would be a reverse repo transaction. And only uh, a few institutions like the Fed use the opposite nomenclature versus the rest of the market. So the Fed is really doing what we would call a repo. Well, they are calling a reverse repo, but this is the normal terminology. Um, with the collateral, markets, repo markets vary in how uh, what you can do with that collateral while it's pledged to you. And rehypothecation is allowing uh, the cash lender to take that collateral and reuse it to either, um, for example, sell it uh, if they want to shorter security, or they can repledge it in their own repo transaction. And Manmohan Singh has this nice paper showing collateral chains or the same collateral is pledged in a repo contract and then the cash lender goes and repledges that same collateral to receive cash themselves and that can happen multiple times okay um, uh, and lastly uh, there's a difference between default versus to fail to deliver when you're unwinding a repo contract so if a party that's borrowing cash doesn't return the cash that is considered a default like bankruptcy like event and the cash lender keeps the securities but if the party that lent the cash that has the securities now chooses to, they can wait to receive the cash and pay a fee for this, uh, but this would not be a default. And this is simply called a fail or a fail to deliver. And this can happen whenever the collateral is very useful to hold for trading purposes, i.e. it's what we would call special. Okay, uh, specialness relates also to the pricing of a repo contract. We can think about pricing in standard repo uh, coming from simply a relationship between a bond's uh, spot and future price. Uh, but some securities have additional value for trading purposes because when you settle a trade, you have to provide that particular QCIP. Or when you're trading an interest rate swap, then it's referencing only the on-the-run QCIP. And so you want to have that particular security to be properly hedged. Um, uh, so um, traders will, uh, for securities that have particular interest in trading at the moment, uh, then uh, locating those securities in the repo market can oops, uh, command a premium. And uh, dealers will often offer uh, cash to uh, locate the security in the repo market at a very low repo rate, sometimes even a negative rate. Okay. Uh, and, um, uh, and this, this uh, oftentimes security specialness is very similar to in securities lending, where you have a premium or, uh, for a sec lending fee to borrow a for example, Tesla stock, if you want to short it, it's a very similar mechanism uh, that can cause repo rates to differ across different collateral types because one collateral is more special than the other. Uh, segmented, uh, the repo market is can be very segmented. Uh, in the US, we have a segmented market in terms of cash lenders versus cash borrowers. Uh, it, outside of, your, of the US, we have uh, geographies that are very segmented within, within Europe, for example. Uh, in the US, we have cash lenders that form relationships with cash borrowers that leads to preferential pricing where 
uh, relationship borrowers to get uh, better pricing. And we see rate dispersion across different, different repo markets for that uh, due to that purpose. Uh, and then lastly, uh, repo pricing is becoming more broadly applicable for the market due to, as Eric mentioned, so far the secured overnight funding rate, which uses aggregate repo rates on the non-special collateral. And it's used to replace, it's being used in the US to replace LIBOR by 2023 as the US floating interest rate benchmark. And so that will affect broader market pricing on even things like, you know, adjustable rate mortgages or floating rate debt. Okay. There are a lot of close substitutes for repo um, uh, or variations on, on a theme. Uh, these include sell buybacks. This is used uh, in markets where there isn't a developed repo market. For example, Spain uh, uses these commonly. Italy used to use these uh, in prior years uh, where the interest is simply embedded in the repo market price at maturity, uh, not legally separate from it. This simply facilitates uh, new market growth. Uh, there is a tri-party variation, which is common in the popular in the U.S., where you have a clearing bank who provides some services like uh, sometimes netting, but also custody valuation and settlement that helps uh, cash lenders access the market. So it provides um, more cash lending in the market and cheap funding for sophisticated dealers who form relationships with them. There are also other repo products like dollar loan rolls or whole loan repo that are used in specific areas like mortgage backed securities or financing credit card loans. And these have their own um, variations on the repo product in terms of what collateral is acceptable uh, as a, as a um, uh, to finance the, the repo. And then lastly, repo to maturity is, is popular in securities financing where you want to repo, uh, the maturity of the repo transaction is matched with the maturity of the collateral. So you can finance something like an illiquid um, sovereign bond uh, this way, as MF Global did with their Italian bonds. In terms of markets for trading repo, uh, in the US, there are three main categories of markets. There's the tri-party market, which is, we said, was a cash uh, lender uh, market. And then there's the GCF repo market, which is an inter-dealer market. Uh, and then there's bilateral repo. And I would clarify categories, these as cash lenders who provide cash to the GCF repo market and bilateral, where dealers are managing their bond trading inventory. And in the bilateral market, then we have uh, uh, dealers who are trying to locate specific securities for trading purposes, or they're funding their dealer clients' positions. Uh, the Fed Reserve, uh, Fed's reverse repo program is included in tri-party repo, and we've seen uh, a massive rise in that program uh, by about one and a half trillion dollars as the Fed has raised interest rates on ONRRP. Okay, and we can see when we talk about systemic risk that there are runs sometimes in, in the repo markets. Um, in Europe, though, uh, we have, first of all, unlike the U.S., great uh, detailed public daily data by the MMSR data set, um, and um, uh, a lot of localized markets, so it's a much more segmented market. As uh, Schaffner Ronaldo Tatsaronis mentioned in a 2019 paper, uh, there's a scarcity of European uh, bond collateral, which has really contributed to fragmenting this market as dealers are sticking to kind of a home bias trading their home country bonds. But um, unlike the US, more repo there is uh, centrally cleared mostly. And so that makes it more resilient to disruptions. And they have this um, different behavior versus the US where investors flock to repo during risk off periods because of this central clearing uh, and reduced counterparty risk. So, and I'll mention just briefly that in the UK, they have a sophisticated advanced repo market, but it is, operates essentially in tandem with the securities lending market as, as one market with very low barriers to entry. Okay, in terms of, uh, we hear a lot about repo markets in terms of what goes wrong in the repo markets. And so systemic risk and fragility are an important part of the literature. Um, uh, particularly about liquidity spirals and, and, and a market crash versus dealer-specific shocks. So, for example, Gordon and Metric and Gordon, Metric and Ross study the U.S. mostly bilateral repo market and uh, suggest that there was a downward spiral in overall market liquidity due to higher haircuts and credit rationing in the repo market that caused asset rate pricing and just a downward liquidity spiral. Uh, Copeland, Martin, and Walker, and Christian Murphy, Nagel, and Orla are, the, are um, important kind of counterpoints in this paper paper uh, line of literature uh, that look at, at least in the tri-party market, some um, individual level data on transactions that suggest that really a lot of the runs were, were dealer specific, combined to individual dealers like Neiman or Bear Stearns, uh, but the rest of the market continued to function fairly well in the United States. Um, but other papers uh, that I mentioned in the chapter show that uh, if repo market um, financing declines and dealers can't access repo financing, then they do uh, shrink their bond trading activity. They shrink their inventory positions. They widen their bid-ask spreads. 
and they increase customer trading costs even during good times, so even outside of crises. And so this uh, kind of justifies the rise since 2008 of repo as a concern that's addressed in a lot of macroprudential regulation we've seen globally. Um, uh, what are important things to think about in terms of this macroprudential regulation? Well, we do see still today regular seasonality that's caused by capital regulations, requirements and bank regulation as um, end of quarter, end of year seasonality as some dealers temporarily exit the market to uh, seems to be to window address their balance sheet. Um, uh, we don't see that in U.S. Uh, repo market uh, dealers or U.S. banks that operate in repo because U.S. banks report quarter end and quarter average uh, activity. And so there's no hiding, uh, whereas uh, some European dealers who report just snapshots at the end of the quarter can shrink their activity then and then resume it once the new quarter starts. Uh, additionally, for uh, banks, repo has become more expensive due to the leverage ratio and the liquidity coverage ratio. And there uh, is a new strand of literature that shows that this has an un unintended effect of worsening bond market liquidity because of this reduction in repo accessibility for bank dealers. Uh, and lastly, the Fed's reverse repo uh, ONRP is a, is a recent innovation since 2014. It's been meant to absorb cash and, as Eric mentioned, strengthen the floor under interest rates. Um, and it has uh, massively grown in the last um, really four or five months uh, to one and a half trillion dollars as the Fed raised this rate to five basis points. Um, one of the ways to, to give context is I'll wrap it up quickly is how is what is the Fed doing by this? They are buying securities, then funding them in repo. Uh, they are essentially keeping reserves at their target level while draining duration and convexity exposure out of the market for investors. And so this is an interesting evolution in Fed policy making and what they're trying to do. Uh, it's an innovation. And I would say that uh, the repo market's born out of innovation. We shouldn't be surprised to see it continue. Uh, it is now a key funding source in the broader market liquidity. Uh, disruptions in repo affect dis uh, cause disruptions in bond market liquidity. There's a lot of variations in this contract, but I think um, many of us would agree that this market's likely to stay critical to broader financial markets in, in the years to come. I think I'm out of time there, so I'll, I'll stop right there. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And Eric is going to discuss. You're muted, Eric. There, okay, I had a little trouble unmuting myself. So okay. you can hear me now, right? Yeah, we hear you and we see you. Very good. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so there we go. So uh, I learned a lot from reading this paper. I knew a little bit about repo before and so now I understand it much better. Um, I'll, I'll just focus on my comments here. My main one is I would like to see more discussion of specialness. I find this to be by far the most interesting part. And I think it's not explained very well in the chapters it's currently written. In fact, I emailed Ben a question because I was so confused by it. Um, but I think I figured it out now. Um, and then some more minor stuff. I'll ask some, for some clarification of clean versus dirty prices, a little more discussion there. I would like to see more discussion of what happened in September 2019. So I think Ben didn't even mention that in his presentation, but it was a big, big deal. Uh, and so I think there needs to be a little discussion of, of that. And then I'll, I'll send Ben some comments separately that are more minor and technical. Uh, so let's talk about specialness because I find this to be the most interesting thing. So repo rates for some securities are lower than repo rates for other securities. Okay, so why is that? Bond dealers and traders can make some money by trading securities, but they can't trade a security or they can't sell a security that they don't have. So they have to either borrow that security short or alternatively, they can go do a cash out repo to get the security that way. Okay, so that's how they borrow the security and then they can make some money by selling it. Okay, securities that can be traded the most profitably each day will be the most special because traders are going to want those. They can make a little money off of it. And so those, those are the ones that they're going to be willing to, um, uh, to, to do the lowest repo rates for. Repo rates will be lowest for those because that collateral is so useful. To, uh, to the traders. So typically what can be traded the most profitably? Typically that would usually be the most liquid securities. Um, and I think that's emphasized in this paper by Daryl Duffy in the Journal of Finance in 1996, but it doesn't have to be. I suppose there could be some securities that are maybe less liquid, but just happen to have large, maybe large volatility or just some kind of large pricing anomaly. And so then in that case, you could get large specialness there, even if the security is not the most liquid. Um, so I always thought of the repo rate um, before I read this chapter 
I always thought of it as a risk-free rate because it's collateralized, right? Um, so that was my understanding. Um, but, but I realized that that's wrong um, because the repo rate is actually a difference between two interest rates. It's the interest rate to borrow the cash minus the interest rate to borrow the security. So you have sort of two transactions going on and the repo rate is the net interest rate between those two. The latter interest rate is larger for more special securities. If there's a security that is very profitable to trade, then the interest rate to borrow that security will be high. And so the repo rate will be lower for that security. So it's a more special uh, repo transaction. The repo rate is only a risk-free rate if we think that latter interest rate is literally zero. And so I, I have a question, to what extent do we think that's true? If it's a very far off the run treasury, is it really, you know, maybe it's true that there's no trading opportunity. So is it really a zero interest rate on that? I, I'm not sure, but maybe. Um, in general though, the repo rate will lie below the true risk-free rate. And, and as Ben mentioned, it could even be negative because if the, interest, if the security is very profitable to trade, this interest rate could be bigger than the cash interest rate. So you could end up with a negative repo rate for a very special security. Okay, um, there's two equations in the chapter, two or three, but two relating um, to specialness. So here's one of them. Um, P is the spot price of a given bond. F is the current future price of the bond delivered in T days. And so there's sort of this current um, future parity where R is the implied gross overnight repo rate and then bought in the denominator here r is not really specified i think that it's the risk-free gross overnight interest rate so risk-free here would be sort of the shadow risk-free gross overnight interest rate um, there really ought to be parentheses here if that's the case so um so there's but, but i i believe that's what this formula is trying to get at there's a second formula here which claims that there's some arbitrage opportunities that you know if if P is the spot price of a general collateral bond and P prime is the spot price of a special bond and then little r is the special repo rate and big R is the general collateral repo rate, then there's this argument in the paper that there's an arbitrage opportunity here that, that this sort of, you know, the, the difference between P prime and P tells you the difference between R and R. But there's no, the arbitrage argument here is not clear. Um, so, I mean, it's, it, there, there's no, you know, where's the price next period? It's, it's not there, it's missing. So it must be, this, this must be a, an arbitrage to maturity. So this must be a repo to maturity arbitrage idea. And, and even then P and P prime would have to be reversed. Cause I have, if, if P is the general, is the spe, if, P, if P prime is the special bond, I wanna take the special bond today then I repo out at one plus R and then, you know, at, until maturity, whereas I have P general collateral, I repo it out at one plus R to maturity. Those should be equal if I repo them both out to maturity. I'll also point out that in the top panel here, the R's are gross interest rates. In the bottom panel here, they're net interest rates. There's one pluses here. So now you have the sort of this disagreement between the, the notation, which probably ought to be cleaned up. So there's some minor stuff there. Okay, um, my second comment was clean versus dirty price. This is more minor. Um, the clean price of a bond is the price of the bond just with no adjustments for anything. It's just the price of the bond in the market. The dirty price takes that price and then includes an adjustment for accrued interest. Um, how is that adjustment done exactly? Maybe give a little bit of an example, like how do you adjust for the accrued interest? Um, the clean versus dirty price. I showed you some formulas on the last slide, but whether the price is clean or dirty affects those formulas. So, I mean, we need to specify in those formulas, are those the clean prices? Are they the dirty prices? Um, in the market, what's the standard quoting convention? Let's just be a little clearer about that. Um, so that's that's all. My, my next, my third comment, I think my final comment is what happened in September, 2019? Here it is, there's this spike of 500, essentially five, I guess it's three or 400 basis points above what it should have been. So it's a three or 400 basis point spike that did not get arbitraged away in mid-September, 2019. Um, there's the uh, paper, uh, a couple papers maybe by some guys at the Fed and the New York Fed who give an explanation. The explanation seems to be based on inertia in the repo market and sort of short run inelastic supply and demand both in the repo market. So you end up with these spikes because the demand is just inelastic and the supply is inelastic. It's, it's still surprising. 
what does this say? What does this inelastic supply and demand mean? What does it say about arbitrage in the money markets in general and the repo market in particular? You know, normally we think arbitrage should be keeping everything you know, sort of in line. What does this say about supply and demand in the repo market? I mean, it just seems like there's some big issues here that, um, that should definitely be touched on. And, and the papers kind of you know, doesn't really talk about those at all. So, so just to summarize my comments, I think a lot more discussion of specialness would be nice. Um, clean versus dirty prices, we should probably have a little on that. What happened in September 2019? And then I have some more minor stuff that I'll email to Ben separately. Thank you. Uh, Angelo, you have a question. Yes, uh, I would like to raise two points. The first one is more on European um, evidence that we have, uh, we have seen repo rates, but any, including general collateral repo rates and specials that have been traded below the deposit facility rate at the ECB since several years now. <clears throat> and I think that should be mentioned in a, in, a, in, a, in a chapter on repos. Uh, from Eric's point of view, there will be an arbitrage violation, but actually uh, maybe can be rationalized with um, uh, heterogeneous demand, rigid demand for, for collateral. Especially, uh, and they are different, right? For instance, for a, German, for a German government bond, you have a preferred habitat for some reason because it provides more convenience, more liquidity services, and then you want to pay for that. That's one the first point. The second is a, an important regula regulatory issue in Europe that we have. It's massive, not has been documented yet. It, it goes like that. There is margin procyclicality, right? Clearing house demand more margin when, when there is volatility, a distressed market. But then the regulatory framework, the EMIR regulator, regulation forces them to reverse this cash, cash, cash margin back to the repo market. And this creates a downward pressure on repo rates, a kind of counter cyclical effect, which is uh, in, from a financial stability point of view, kind of um, automatic um, uh, cheaper funding cost. Uh, induced by regulation. I think this could be a, an interesting point to touch upon. But it was a, a very nice presentation. Any other questions or comments? I'll, I'll add in one quickly that uh, I think it'd be interesting to talk about the pros and cons of central clearing of repo, uh, which, which uh, I mean, you, you touched on that briefly, but it would be interesting to do a bit more on that. Uh, any other questions? Jonathan, um, there is a question from the attendees, and I'm going to give the floor to Gerald Ferrara. You can unmute yourself and ask. Yeah. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, thank you very much. This is Gerardo Ferrara uh, from the Bank of England. Um, I had a question about the portfolio of uh, um, securities, uh, or better. How, how does it work this market? Uh, whenever, whenever someone uh, wants to make a transaction of this type, uh, and so there is a possibility for someone looking for a specific type of security to look for this in the repo market. But my understanding, there are different configurations of uh, uh, the securities that can uh, can be uh, underlying this type of contract. It can be a portfolio of securities. Can be a, a single security. Um, can be linked to a system like Crest, where the security will be uh, uh, linked to um, um, to a basket, where it's possible to pick up just one of the collaterals that were stored in this basket and can be used to uh, to enter into the repo contract. I think it's, it's really important to understand the function of the repo market, to understand what is the functioning of a choice behind the security that has been uh, deployed in order to enter in this type of contract. And I don't think it has been discussed so far. I thought it, it would have been uh, uh, useful. Uh, and then I fully, I fully support what Andrew Ronaldo was doing. I thought that the, the, the point uh, about the, uh, this uh, sort of collateral uh, cycle and uh, the impact that it will have on the, the downward pressure or repo rates was a very neat one. And, uh, so I fully support also his comment. Thank you very much for giving me the possibility to comment such an interesting piece of uh, 
research, I would say, or book. Uh, but thank you. Thank you. Ben, it, it is something urgently you'd like to respond to. Other things can be put in the, in the chat. Okay, I'll, I'll just very briefly say thank you. I think a lot of this I could talk mm -hmm. about with collateral. So very good comments about, I think specialness and a lot of the later comments could all be talked about in the context of collateral. And I think um, I had tried to keep under the, the uh, length restrictions, but I think I definitely is worth adding and I will, will do that. And thank you, Angela, also for some good points as well. I, uh, I'll, I'll stop there and answer and chat the rest. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, and we're, but we're back on time. And next up is the Treasury market and Benson Durham is going to present this. Okay, hello, I hope everything's okay. You can see and hear me all right. Yeah, um, we see you. Thank you. Okay, terrific. Um, yeah, look, I mean, I guess uh, I could burn much of my 15 minutes uh, thanking both Jonathan and Rafet as everyone duly has for uh, assembling everybody um, and also uh, inviting us uh, to participate. So uh, thank you very much. And also it's great to uh, see so many former uh, colleagues and uh, um, it's uh, a pain, uh, unfortunate that we can't, See each other, so let me just. I don't want to spend a lot of time, but thank you and hello. Um, I also have a bit more um, housekeeping. You know, like if someone asks you to write our, us a chapter on the uh, treasury market, you know, kind of at first blush, that's you know, seems very easy, right? I know about the treasury market, I think about it all the time, uh, but uh, lots of other people do too. Uh, so that, in fact, makes it really hard. Uh, it also is uh, challenging when you know your two editors, as well as a lot of contributors to the same volume are the very people that did so much to um, you know, help teach you about the market. So um, I guess besides uh, overcoming some imposter syndrome, uh, we both Roberto and I kind of approached this with a, a lot of humility. Okay, so um, this is gonna be a, a, a tough, tough going. A, a couple of the caveats too more seriously, um, both Roberto and I are you know, kind of market participants. There are a couple others I think among the contributors. So. I think both in the text and as you'll see in my comments, they will kind of veer more uh, probably toward an investor's uh, perspective to some extent. And I'll also say this more about my comments that I will say here and what I put together and less about the text. They will also veer more towards asset pricing and what we kind of can glean from the treasury market as opposed to some of the very interesting uh, market microstructure issues. Although I'll kind of come back to that um, um, you know, kind of a, a little bit. Um, and I will go through, uh, you'll see, a, a, I'll take a couple tangents here um, and not necessarily uh, focus exactly what's in the chapter, but, you know, kind of for the sake of, of, uh, of discussion, um, go, you know, kind of a little bit off, uh, take some of these topics and run with them for a little bit for the sake of uh, uh, my 15 uh, minutes. But as a hedge against that, I want to be dead certain that I show you exactly what is in the chapter. Uh, and so that's why I have this very... Uh, clear uh, um, outline of what we literally have, you know, kind of section by section. So um, we start out with, you know, a you know, summary description of the tre treasury market in very basic, uh, basic sense, talk about marketable and non-marketable securities, types of marketable securities, uh, determinants of treasury issuance patterns. And, you know, even there, we have a lot to, uh, lot to cover, uh, primary versus secondary markets, uh, and also measures of market liquidity that we go through. And I'll actually spend a little bit of time um, today arguing that you know, we need to pay special attention to these, even with some of the models that we uh, write down and traffic in all the time. Um, <clears throat> then we have a section on the auction process, you know, kind of go through the uh, mechanics of uh, treasury auctions, the, uh, the diminishing role of primary dealers insofar as they're taking down uh, less of the auction amounts uh, over time. Um, how do you measure success of an auction? We see this as market participants all the time. And then spend a little bit of time on the so-called uh, win issue uh, market. Uh, we have some empirical results that I would characterize as, you know, kind of preliminary and exploratory rather than uh, definitive um, on premiums and the technically the on the run and the wish you, win issue uh, uh, markets that I'll, I'll actually cover a little bit today. Um, and we go through some sensitivity analysis of that um, in our paper. Uh, and then we close with, um, couldn't resist doing this, but it's, it's hard to do because the literature is so vast, just a little bit, give our readers a little bit on uh, secondary market pricing and uh, interpretation of the yield curve, okay? So those are the topics that we, um, very difficult to organize and very challenging, but this is uh, you know, kind of what we have uh, so far and it's fair game. 
as far as my the rest of my remarks, and um, again for the sake of the discussion of uh, and get your you know, kind of peak people's interest uh, in the uh, in the chapter, let me start with a little bit of you know some observations about interpretation of the yield curve, and um, you know this is very rudimentary, and uh, but we do we do cover this in the uh, in the text. So the yield curve, of course, is the schedule of uh, yields by uh, maturity uh, for uh, different instruments. Um, and sometimes the yield curve uh, slopes down. I have the steepest inversion in my sample going back to 1987 on a daily basis uh, through uh, uh, Friday. Uh, sometimes the yield curve uh, slopes up. I have the steepest slope between uh, three months and 10 years here uh, in blue. And then I've denoted the uh, uh, sample average uh, uh, term structure. So this here at the left is the average three month rate on a daily basis uh, going back to 1987. And then I have the uh, average 10 year yield as well. Okay, and you can see that the yield curve is on average uh, upward sloping, we all know this. Uh, what kind of framework do we have uh, for you know, kind of explaining this? We have the, uh, start off with the, you know, the expectations hypothesis, right? Which says that uh, any in year yield is uh, comprised of an average of expected short rates, uh, you know, kind of over, uh, over that uh, given uh, horizon. Um, and what I will say, just from you know talking to market participants every day, is that I would say that this expectations hypothesis, um, and even in its pure form, that is not even allowing for um, constant term premiums, is alive and well, and live and well among uh, investors uh, as well as the financial press. And I say that not to disparage them, uh, but to suggest that maybe we have more uh, work to do in kind of um, um, disabusing them of that of that idea. Um, but there is some prima facie kind of evidence that um, the expectations hypothesis can't really be so. Um, and some of you have seen this argument before um, that if you see in the bottom panel here, what I'm showing is the uh, daily observations of the slope between 10 and three years, uh, just a simple histogram. Um, and you can see that 92% of all the observations are to the right of the origin, meaning 92% of the time on a daily basis, going back to 1987, uh, the VO curve has been upward sloping rather than downward sloping. And if the expectations hypothesis were right, um, that would imply that investors expected the Fed to have been tightening 92% of the time, okay? Which seems implausible because because we had, uh, you know, at least four uh, MBER uh, recessions um, uh, during that period, right? So that seems like it's a, a stretch to, to, uh, to think that the expectations hypothesis holds in its, in its strict form. Um, now, we talk about the distinction between expected rates and term premiums mattering for monetary policy um, in the sense that, you know, you get two different interpretations of a upward sloping yield curve, right? If the yield curve is upward sloping because expected rates are expected to be high or higher, then the Fed should be tightening monetary policy because expectations for growth and inflation are higher. But if the conversely, if risk aversion is high and term premiums are high, then that would be motivation for uh, the central bank to be easing monetary policy uh, um, instead. Um, I think this also matters for practitioners. We don't really talk about it very much, but if the expected rate, uh, the yield curve upward sloping because the expected rate is, is higher, um, that means expected cash rates are higher, and that would mean that expected returns, excess returns on all assets are, um, are lower. Um, and what that does is doesn't really change your allocation across assets, but just simply lowers the uh, efficient frontier uh, and having lower expected returns. Whereas conversely, if the yield curve is upward sloping uh, because of higher term premiums, that means that required returns on treasuries are higher. And all else equal, that would mean you would have a different allocation, uh, optimal allocation with a higher allocation, all else equal to uh, uh, treasuries and your allocation would actually um, look different. I think we would all kind of acknowledge though, I mean, although there's a motivation for distinguishing be between uh, expected rates and term premiums, um, that um, you know, there's a lot of model uncertainty. We have a lot of difficulty with um, processes that are uh, stationary, but we have very short samples. We have a really hard time you know, kind of pinning down uh, mean reversion speeds. Um, and we get even very different estimates when we use diff different samples. So our estimates when we use a lot of data uh, we tend to get very, um, you know, kind of higher expected short rates and lower term premiums. But when we use more recent data uh, with shorter samples, we tend to get, you know, lower expected short rate paths and, and higher term premiums. And this is very hard to explain to uh, market participants uh, 
because they get frustrated without being able to nail down a term premium with, uh, with much, uh, much precision. Um, I'm actually gonna complicate this a little bit by uh, saying that this is even uh, uh, a harder in some sense by looking at uh, the, real, the real term structure. Um, and what I've got here is uh, the same charts I showed on the previous page, but for uh, tips. And so we get the same story that on average, the uh, uh, tips curve is upward sloping. Um, and we acknowledge that, well, this doesn't probably plausibly uh, reflect the fact that investors expect the Fed to be tightening in real terms. It turns out, you know, 88% of the time since uh, 2004. And so similarly, we say, well, what is this wedge? Why could the term, the uh, yield curve, real yield curve, tips curve be uh, upward sloping? Uh, we provision for the prospect that there might be real, real term premiums. But we also acknowledge that tips could embed a liquidity premium because we observe that tips are less liquid than nominals and in a certain sense are uh, less liquid uh, in absolute terms uh, as well. So we could argue that tips yields are higher even after 2004 uh, because of uh, liquidity premiums. Um, so that complicates matters. And what I started to ask, we have this section in the, uh, in the paper where we cover um, what, you know, liquidity premium in treasuries uh, and how they differ uh, over time in terms of uh, volume, say uh, bid ask spreads, on the run premiums and, and curve fitting errors, um, which gets one to wonder. Um, and here I'm not, this is not in the chapter, but I, what I'm trying to do is kind of uh, emphasize imp how important liquidity premia are. And in fact, I haven't shown anyone the, these, uh, these results, but you, know, you could think of um, coming up with a treasury, a nominal treasury liquidity factor. Uh, we do this with tips all the time. We think of tips uh, uh, volumes and curve fitting errors, and we use this as a factor to actually price uh, price the term structure. Well, you know, one could do this for nominals as well because we do have time uh, variation in the bid ask spreads. We have time variation in uh, um, fitting errors and so forth and so on. And we can actually form a term structure model by considering liquidity as an explicit factor, not just for tips but also for nominals. Um, and we can decompose um, nominal required returns, what we usually call term premiums, into frictionless term premiums and uh, liquidity premiums. And it turns out when you do this, you kind of get a very different picture um, of what term premiums, uh, uh, how they, in certain key periods over time. So in red here, I have the kind of thing of this is the traditional ACM uh, based term premium. Uh, but I've decomposed it into this uh, fric frictionless term premium and a uh, liquidity premium uh, explicitly uh, for the 10-year uh, horizon. And you get a very different story about um, the financial crisis. So typically, you know, from the ACM model and to Kim Wright, to a lesser degree, that uh, term premiums were higher in the financial crisis. But according to this decomposition, when we explicitly account for liquidity premia, uh, most of that is higher liquidity premia, whereas the frictionless uh, term premium is actually um, uh, negative. And that may say something about um, which part of term premium are uh, uh, counter cyclical uh, uh, or not. Um, and of course, when you get different term premium estimates, you get different estimates for the um, uh, expected path of rates. And you can distinguish between expected rates and frictionless uh, uh, expected rates, uh, as I've tried to do in the top panel. Um, Another part of the paper that we we uh, we take a look at the wind issue market and uh, and here this is uh, not completely distinct from thinking about uh, liquidity premium although it's you know a little bit more in uh, specific uh, segment of the treasury market uh, I'm running out of time but um, we just wanted to take an exploratory look because there really doesn't seem to be a lot in the literature on um, wind issue pricing uh, relative to other other securities um, and so our motivation here. What we're doing is basically our workhorse methodology is to think about pricing errors relative to a fitted curve. So if you look at this equation, we have quotes on the uh, wind issue uh, uh, security, and then we have a fitted value based on an estimated discount factor. Now we've estimated the discount factor obviously with issues that are, uh, are issued. Um, and then we apply that, uh, think of this as kind of a synthetic yield on the, on the wind issue. And this is our premium. Uh, and we go back on our sample uh, back to uh, early uh, 1987. You can see here as an example, we fit the curve. These uh, red dots here um, at the bottom are solid dots are the actual wind issue uh, yields. And the uh, hollow uh, red dots are where the fitted value should be. And you can see that 
here, at least in this example, they're trading, you know, kind of below the fitted, uh, the fitted curve. And so there's actual premium uh, for the wind issue uh, security. We do this over time, obviously, for all observations in our sample. And this uh, black line is the time series that we get. And on average, you can see that in general, the wind issues uh, do tend to trade below uh, the fit of curve. But in closing, I would make three observations about this. You know, one is this is very variable uh, series. It's very volatile. So it's not, you know, kind of always, uh, always positive. Um, a second is this is, you know, maybe a measure of treasury market illiquidity, but it doesn't correlate positively or negatively at all. It seems to be an orthogonal source. And indeed, it's uncorrelated to uh, overall curve fitting errors uh, over our sample. So it may be telling us something different. And we do uh, find some differences in terms of tenors. Uh, and other factors which are, uh, are interesting to us. So here, down here in the bottom panel, we're showing on a QCIP by QCIP basis, the blue dots are the 10-year uh, the win issue premiums and the green dots are for the two-year. Um, and statistically, when we look more at uh, conditional errors, we find that there is uh, more uh, uh, win issue premiums are actually higher for the 10-year for the sector, which may be another argument. And I think David might have some comments on that market segmentation in the treasury market. Uh, so sorry, the fact that I run over is uh, pretty indicative of uh, the challenges that we had in trying to cover uh, such a familiar but uh, challenging market, but uh, that's what we have so far, so thanks. Thank you, Benson. And David Luca will discuss. Um, hello, everyone. I uh, hope you can uh, see my slide and hear me. Yes, we can. Um, perfect. Um, so first, thanks to uh, Rafet and Jonathan for inviting me to discuss uh, this great paper. Um, I have a very long disclaimer, which I am actually going to read. Uh, the first part is standard. The second part of the disclaimer shown at the bottom, uh, because we're at FOMC week, it's, it states that in compliance with FOMC policy on external communications during blackout periods during this presentation, I will refrain from expressing views or providing analysis to members of the public about current and prospective monetary policy issues. Next, I'm going to speak a little bit more slowly. Okay, next slide. Uh, just as an overview of my discussion today, um, I'll kind of do three things. First, overview the paper structure, provide some general comments. Uh, second, uh, give some uh, brief comments on the pricing analysis in the when issued market, which is some new results uh, that Benson has uh, provided us, uh, quite interesting. Um, and then I'm going to try to provide uh, some complementary literature that is not covered in, in the paper, um, just to uh, also think about future uh, uh, direction of the literature itself. Uh, this is not to say that it's kind of a big omission from uh, Benson, and Benson noted that, you know, the treasury market is kind of a big beast to, uh, to cover into uh, the space that he has been uh, given. So just in terms of paper structure, uh, there are four main sections. Um, and they kind of shift gear to some extent. So the first section is a, a summary description of the treasury market is largely an institutional overview and provides a fair amount of statistics, which are quite interesting. Uh, it then shifts to the primary market. Um, again, an overview of the institutions, what types of bidders there are, uh, what are the uh, takedowns at the auctions and the bid to cover ratios and things like that uh, with a fair amount of statistics. The Venetian market, there's kind of a shifting gear. Um, Benson and, and Roberto are providing us with new analysis on pricing of uh, WIs. Um, and then lastly, there was a discussion of secondary market pricing and interpretation of the yield curve that Benson kind of uh, uh, overviewed. There was a fair amount of uh, focus on the expectation hypothesis and uh, affine infrastructure models. Um, so um, my general comments are, I think it's very hard to fit, I think as it was discussed before, fit everything in one paper. Um, I think to some extent, uh, there's a lot of emphasis given to the pricing analysis on WIs, which I think it's quite interesting, but you know, I wonder whether uh, some space could be shifted from section three to, to, to section four. Um, so, so again, it's a great institutional review. There's a lot of background, so great for people who are coming in into the market, and there's a fair amount of statistics, which are uh, the right things to show. Um, and then I'm going to discuss actually a little bit more deeply the, the pricing of WIs, um, just one potential caveat to that analysis, um, and then give more references to existing literature that are actually not covered currently in, in the chapter. It doesn't mean that it's not covering any uh, literature currently, but just providing additional, additional um, uh, references. So first of all, on that management and auctions, um, the literature is actually fairly small as, a, as of today. 
Um, I, I would note um, one thing that the paper does not really discuss is the concept of regular and predictable that could be useful just to discuss. Um, I would invite maybe the authors to uh, include maybe a discussion, you know, a, a reference to Garbade's one of his books. Um, in recent years, um, in terms of research literature, kind of academic literature, there's been a lot of discussion about the benefits and the cons of tips issuance. Um, that's something that could be included. And then really moving into auctions, um, there is a fair amount of institutional review, and I think it's quite interesting. And of course, market, market participants are really interested in auctions themselves. The literature is kind of small. And the reason why it's small is because essentially it's very hard or nearly impossible with the exception of one paper by Hortax, uh, Castle and Zhang, to have if, uh, to have data uh, uh, of, of auction of like micro level data on, on auction results. Uh, the only really contributions to the literature have been um, earlier in the 1990s, uh, one in reference to the Salomon scandal and then um, other literature moving from discriminatory to, to uniform price auctions. More recently, um, there has been more discussion about the role of primary dealers could be useful to um, in, include some of this literature. Uh, importantly, the contribution by Lu Yan and Zhang and also the discussion in Duffy as to why uh, uh, treasury uh, concessions uh, do occur, meaning that prices tend to be lower at auctions and then kind of come back up. Uh, some people have argued that this is rigging and you know, we have theory in economics that tells us why that could be the case. Um, I also have uh, uh, work on thinking about the role of primary dealers in terms of information sharing um, uh, into auctions. I would say this part of the literature is very scant um, and you know, there could be some additional sites, but just that's just something that the academic literature has not really worked much into. With respect to the pricing analysis of the WI market, um, I think these are great results. And this is, this is, the analysis here is really uh, complementing uh, new results by uh, uh, Fleming, Shakar, and, and Fantasso, that are a colleague of mine at the New York Fed, looking at the liquidity uh, using trace data in the WI market. Um, just for references, uh, what are WIs? Uh, Treasury uh, are first announced as securities to the public, then they're auctioned, and then they're issued. And when issued, uh, the trading is really the trading that occurs from the announcement um, to the issuance. There are really kind of two distinct periods, um, and this is both highlighted in the paper and, and this other work by my colleagues. There's kind of a pre-auction period, um, which is uh, what I would say proper when issued trading, um, as many people think about it. Here, uh, the securities are traded on a yield basis. Um, and they are important because they contribute to the price discovery at auction. This is how the dealers are hedging their, their pipeline and their orders into the auction between direct and indirect bids. Then there is some post-auction trading. This is from the auction to the issue date itself. Here, securities are both when issued, but they're actually already on the runs. So in fact, there, in fact, there is a switch in the uh, convention in pricing in the market where securities now are traded on the price basis. The paper, um, as far as, as I understood, I, I did send a message to, to Benson. I actually did ask Michael, my colleague as well, because um, I, I, I'm not an expert myself on it, um, on this topic. I think it's using price data. So implicitly, it's really looking at the post-auction um, uh, uh, period for the most part. Um, and so this is really essentially an early day on the run trading analysis. So this is in the, you know, similar to kind of the on the run premium calculation in the original GSW uh, paper. So, um, so, you know, I think, I think it's quite interesting, but I'm not sure that this analysis is really telling us a lot about the when issued market in the period that is most interesting in general. Um, but I think interesting nonetheless. Um, I'm going to switch gears and then now talk about the secondary market pricing and interpretation of the yield curve section. I think it's a great discussion, as you heard from Benson, about you know, the expectation hypothesis, how this is being used by market participants and central banks, and some limitation of, of, of fine term structure models. Uh, you know, Benson was uh, very humble and, you know, talking about Rafet and, and, and Jonathan's work, but, you know, Benson himself is a, is a great contributor to this literature. I would say, I think the insights were awesome. Um, I would maybe recommend the authors to add more references, some of the concepts of, about the zero lower bound. I think it would be great to see more direct references to, to the literature and some of these concepts. Um, I'm going to cite next a, a bunch of literature that is not cited, I think, for, for kind of a real estate uh, uh, limitation. 
mentioned uh, that still could be interesting and I thought could be useful to add. Uh, one is generally just price discovery and liquidity. Um, there is discussion of liquidity, but not direct link to the literature. Uh, perhaps just citing or mentioning kind of the work of uh, the large literature on uh, responses of treasury yields to announcements. This can be both uh, be economic announcement or um, uh, central bank announcements, um, as well as liquidity more generally. Of course, there's a whole monster asset pricing literature on this, and we have been told not to discuss that uh, because we're looking at financial markets, not asset pricing. Uh, but you know, the key general contributions in this literature is the usual tension between habit, the habit on the one hand, and the long run risk people uh, on the other. Which I'm, I'm glad we're not writing a chapter on those. Um, and then I think the most interesting part, um, and I think this is very much related to what, what's happening in the in overall in the chapters as well as the, in the current chapter, is kind of the role of intermediaries, investors demand and supply for pricing itself. So over the past few years, we've seen um, the paper rightfully shows kind of the overall sharp increase in treasury market outstanding, but we've also seen very large changes in the ownership of, of treasury securities. And we have contributions today in recent years um, uh, that really think about heterogeneity across investors and how this matter for pricing in this market. Um, I think the most striking thing here are the rightmost bars where you see that the two largest uh, investors, namely the Federal Reserve and the rest of the world, have kind of switched places, uh, almost switched places to some extent. Uh, it's interesting actually to see that in these states, which are not chosen randomly, um, um, if, you know, the two markets account for 52% exactly every single period. Uh, but of course, the share owned by the Federal Reserve is increasing significantly and the rest of the world is declining. Over time, we've also seen a decline in uh, the ownership from long-term investors. And I'm going to cite literature that thinks about that, um, as well as state and local governments. Uh, but we have seen a sharp increase in the ownership of treasuries from uh, money market funds, mutual funds, and ETFs. This is mostly ETFs. Um, as well as household uh, plus hedge fund, because we know that the household sector and the flow of funds is really hedge funds, uh, as well as banks. Um, interestingly, um, brokers and dealers, as we know, they are key uh, uh, investors in this market, but really own a very small fraction of the market generally. They are both long and short, the securities. So what does the literature say um, uh, at this point about these types of investors? Uh, first of all, uh, there is uh, two key contributions on the role of dealers in pricing uh, treasury securities. Um, both Adrian Etula and Muir, I think this is the key uh, uh, site in this literature, but more recently also the work by He, uh, Nagel and Song that look at the sell-off in treasuries in March of last year and really uh, show the importance and discuss the importance of uh, 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 sorry, dealer, uh, brokers and dealers uh, balance sheets in, in pricing um, uh, treasuries uh, and providing liquidity in that market. More generally, uh, this is no longer about you know, habit and long, long run risk in the literature, uh, but it's very much about what we have in the chapter. Um, it's about the types of investors and what, type, what, what those things do to, uh, to pricing. So we have a literature on preferred habitat on long-term investors uh, by Janos and Villa. There's an exclamation mark next to uh, the, the, the publication because finally this paper has been published after for 15 years having told all central bankers why we should be doing uh, quantitative easing. Kudos for Econometrica for doing that um, uh, 15 years later. Um, and then, um, and then we have all sorts of demands for specific from specific investors, uh, such as MBS investors. This is also work by Roberto himself. Um, there is work uh, uh, by Domanski, Shin, and Shusko, although not in the U.S., about generally hedging demand from long-term investors, as well as um, the differential role of, in, uh, of of securities as an inflation hedge or or not. Um, and then, then, of course, there is literature on yield-oriented uh, yield investors. Um, and then on the supply side, uh, there is increased interest um, in really thinking about how much uh, the treasury and debt management uh, matters for pricing of the securities. And the other side of that is QE and how the two things interact. So I am uh, over time, um, well over time, so I'm going to stop talking right now. But you know, the punchline here is that it's super interesting uh, and potentially adding some uh, additional um, uh, references to the literature. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, I think we have time for one question or comment. 
Let me take a second to thank the authors for, in particular, working on the when issued market. Uh, we asked them specifically to include that. And it's a uh, pain in the neck because no one does that. So there's nothing to base on. And uh, it's a great contribution on its own right. Yes. Well, I appreciate that. And my, my response to David's comments, I think we do need to do a better job maybe of framing it and also adding some specificity about you know, when, you know, what part of the when issue premium and uh, you know, the timing of that market that we're, we're capturing. Uh, definitely what we'll do in the, the next round, but I uh, really appreciate all your comments, David. Thank you. Okay, let's move on now to mortgage-backed securities. And Jim is presenting, okay. We see your slides. Great, you can hear me? Yep, we hear you. Excellent, you. okay. Um, uh, so thanks a lot. Uh, I echo everyone else's comments. It's great to be part of this initiative. Uh, so thank you to Rafet and Jonathan uh, for that. So, okay, we're gonna talk about mortgage-backed securities now. Um, and this is a joint effort with uh, with David and uh, and with Andreas Huster. Um, and I won't uh, repeat David's extremely long disclaimer, but but you know the same disclaimer applies. I'm not going to talk about monetary policy, and these are not the views of the Fed. Okay, so uh, so the MBS market is uh, you know one of the largest and most uh, liquid global fixed income markets, uh, particularly in the United States, um, where there's about $11 trillion in bonds outstanding uh, and you know, roughly $250, $300 billion in daily average trading volume. Um, so you know, the US is the largest uh, uh, market, but, but mortgage securitization and, and sort of a related instrument covered bonds are also uh, popular internationally. Um, so this is a key source of financing for real estate. Um, uh, so for example, you know, uh, about two thirds of US home mortgage debt is securitized into AMBS uh, as of 2021. Um, and securitization, you know, there's sort of a, a pretty uh, significant literature that sort of shows that securitization has a variety of effects on sort of, you know, broader financial market and macro outcomes. And I'm going to kind of get back to that uh, at the end a, a little bit if I have time. Um, okay, so, so, you know, what are we trying to do in this chapter? We're trying to review the MBS market uh, with a particular, we sort of review it broadly, but we have a particular emphasis on the agency MBS market in the United States. Um, we're trying to, uh, uh, you know, one, one goal is to present some, you know, a set of stylized facts and statistics about the market size, growth, liquidity, and so forth that will be useful as a resource for people who are interested in this market. Um, and, and then, of course, we're trying to sort of highlight insights from a sort of growing body of academic research on MBS. Uh, this is the structure of the chapter itself. Uh, so we have a section where we talk about the MBS universe. So this is kind of some institutional detail uh, and some time series and cross-sectional facts. Uh, we talk a bit about security design, uh, risks of, age, uh, of MBS and asset pricing, um, the trading environment, um, and then sort of we sort of step back a little bit and talk about, you know, sort of broader economic effects of, of uh, MBS and mortgage securitization. Uh, and then we're kind of finishing up um, with some sort of open questions and sort of ideas for future research. Okay, so, so to start with the universe. Um, so, you know, a simple definition of MBS, these are bonds with um, cash flows that are tied to payments on a pool of underlying mortgages. Um, those mortgages might be either residential or commercial mortgages. So there's a, a market, a MBS market for both of those. Um, we mainly focus on RMBS in the chapter. Um, if you're gonna talk about the MBS market in the United States, sort of a key distinction uh, here is the difference between the agency market and the non-agency market. Um, so the agency, agency MBS um, carry a credit guarantee to investors um, for one of these three agencies, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, or, or, or Ginnie Mae. Um, and that basically is, is essentially insulates the uh, investor from, from credit risk. Um, uh, there's a, a chapter, a separate chapter on these agencies that, that's coming, I think, tomorrow um, that's going to go into a lot more detail about exactly what, what these agencies do. Um, uh, Non-agency MBS, on the other hand, you know, investors are bearing the credit risk. Um, and, and as a result, um, the MBS are sort of tranched by seniority. Um, rather than being passed through pools. And, and that's basically to kind of appeal to different classes of investors with different credit risk appetites. Um, so you have this sort of coexistence of the agency market and the non-agency market um, and sort of competition and substitution between these two markets is kind of a key market uh, dynamic. Uh, um, and this I'd sort of like, you know, people are interested in this, I'd recommend this nice paper by Adelino, McCartney and Schwa that kind of like looks at this substitution in the context of sort of like subprime mortgages in the United States. Uh, so here's some data. This is a plot of the stock of um, uh, uh, residential MBS uh, in the United States over time, uh, scaled by nominal GDP. 
Um, and so you can see this kind of this like very striking growth, obviously, since the, the origins of the market in the 1970s. Uh, you can see the market grows very significantly and peaks at you know, just under 50% of nominal GDP uh, at the end of the 2000s, which is basically kind of the end of the, the, the mortgage boom and the, and the great uh, the global financial crisis. Uh, and particularly notable during this period is this very rapid growth in the non-agency market in the 2000s. And that's basically, you know, predominantly securitization of, of sort of non-prime uh, mortgages uh, with a high level of credit risk. Um, and you can see sort of subsequently to the crisis, this non-agency market really diminishes in size and has now kind of shrunk back to being around the same size as it was in the 1990s. Um, um, so that said, like the overall overall mortgage securitization is still um, very popular and has even become more popular over time. So the black line here is on the right axis and is showing the fraction of residential mortgage debt securitized into MBS. And you can see that that's just kind of continued to trend upwards over time, even, even in the wake of the crisis. And that's basically all, all concentrated in the agency market. Uh, so that's some some time series, uh, you know, uh, facts. Um, if we look in the cross section, so it's one of the things we do in the paper is present sort of a cross sectional snapshot of the agency MBS um, uh, of agency MBS pools based on um, EMBS security level data. Um, so that covers basically. So the universe is there is about seven point seven trillion dollars in pools um, split between Fannie, Freddie, and Ginny. Um, if you look at the the mortgages that are underlying those pools, eighty four percent of that mortgage debt it, it consists of thirty year fixed rate mortgages. So this is an extremely popular product uh, in the United States and particularly for, for um, securitized loans. Um, if you look sort of dig into that, that debt, you know, there's a pretty substantial degree of fragmentation and heterogeneity in terms of the underlying universe. So there are just over slightly over a million uh, individual pools, um, right? And each of those pools is backed by a, a different uh, set of loans, right? So, so each one of them in some sense is unique in terms of its fundamental value. Um, there's a wide range of pool size. So the median on a weighted basis, the median pool size is about $350 million, but then the 99th percentile is about $40 billion, right? So there's like a lot of wide variation there. Uh, and as we show in the paper, there's also kind of wide variation in terms of pool age, coupon, uh, and here it's like prepayment speed, which is particularly important because basically differences in prepayment behavior are the key driver of cross-sectional variation in value across these pools. Um, so you have this sort of fragmented universe, despite that fragmentation, there's actually a very liquid um, and sort of like fairly centralized market for trading uh, MBS. Uh, and that basically occurs through, trading basically occurs through this relatively small number of um, to be announced TBA uh, forward contracts. And I'll talk a little bit more about that TBA market uh, later on. Okay, so that's sort of a sketch of the universe. Uh, so then we start thinking a little bit more about uh, risks and asset pricing. Um, so, so we sort of highlight four, four key uh, you know, risks and drivers of value uh, in the MBS market. So the first one is simply duration risk, interest rate risk. So MBS have fixed coupons and a long notional maturity. So like other fixed income in instruments, they, they move uh, um, with interest rates, inversely with interest rates. Um, a bit more characteristic of, the age of, uh, of MBS, uh, and particularly agency MBS, is the sort of importance of prepayment risk, right? And so this basically arises in the US from the fact that you know, borrowers have fixed rate mortgages and can prepay their mortgage at par any time, right? So, so as an investor, you're basically short that prepayment option. And of course, investors, so borrowers, you know, exercise that option when it's most advantageous, which is, you know, when interest rates have fallen. Um, uh, so there's a lot of academic work, you know, the fairly long tradition to the modeling prepayment and prepayment risk um, uh, using both sort of like reduced forms sort of econometric models, and then also more structural approaches. And I've listed a couple of uh, references there. Um, okay, so then the third risk here is credit risk. So credit risk is not significant for agency MBS because of the guarantee, but this is the kind of the key source of risk for non-agency MBS. Um, um, and you know, there's a, of course a very large literature on mortgage default, particularly in the wake of the, the financial crisis. Um, and, and that literature kind of emphasizes this sort of double trigger of negative equity and income loss. Uh, so this Ganong and Noel is a nice uh, paper, is a nice recent contribution and has references to other, uh, other literature. Uh, and then finally, you know, a, for, a, a final source of you know, variation in value is sort of trading and, and funding liquidity and liquidity risk. Uh, okay, so we're thinking about those risks, you can then sort of like think about, you know, what are the drivers of MBS uh, yields. Um, and so this is kind of just sort of a simple decomposition of the sort of the excess yield of MBS relative to a you know, short term uh, risk free rate. So you can kind of the first component here is a term premium, which reflects the fact that, you know, uh, MBS have a long uh, duration. Um, the second component is the option cost. 
And the option cost conceptually is basically the sort of market value of the borrower's prepayment option. Um, and then the third component here is the option adjusted spread. And the option adjusted spread you can think of as kind of like a residual um, excess rate of return on MBS relative to sort of duration matched treasuries or swaps like after you've adjusted for the prepayment option. Um, so there's a number of papers that sort of think about what are the drivers of OAS, uh, uh, including this uh, nice paper by Boyachenko and, and my two co-authors. And sort of, you know, the, these papers sort of, you know, um, argue and present evidence that, you know, OAS is effectively a reward to the investor for bearing non-interest rate prepayment risk. And what does that mean? So that means like variation in prepayment that's not simply a deterministic function of interest rates. Um, and so some of the, the, the you know, features of the data that are consistent with the story, you know, there's, there's a smile pattern in OAS, which means that OAS is higher for coupons that are trading further from par in either direction, right? And so these are basically coupons where, you know, changes in prepayment because the, prepay the prepayment is happening at par, you know, fluctuations in prepayment have more of an effect on security value. Um, OAS is positive for both interest only and principal only strips that have um, exposure to prepayment in the opposite direction. Uh, and then this, this work also kind of shows that, you know, OAS co-moves with risk premium in other, uh, in other uh, fixed income markets, you know, consistent with the presence of sort of common marginal investors across these markets. Um, so here's some, you know, a simple graph uh, showing some, some you know, features of OAS. So this is the time series behavior of OAS. So you can see OAS is positive on average, um, um, reflecting, you know, um, um, the, the, this uh, prepayment risk premium. Uh, and you can see it moves like fairly significantly over time. It's elevated uh, during the financial crisis uh, when you know, financial intermediaries were obviously fairly constrained. Uh, and, and it tends to be low during periods of, of uh, Federal Reserve quantitative easing. Uh, and the bottom chart here is basically showing, this is looking in the cross section and looking at different TBA uh, cohorts and basically showing that, that the OAS is, uh, you know, has this, exhibits this smile pattern. So when, when you, this is uh, uh, at par and then you can see when securities are far away from par that there's a positive OAS or a larger OAS. Okay, so uh, a little bit about trading. Um, so 90, around 90% of agency MBS trading occurs uh, through this uh, to be announced uh, forward market. Um, the key feature of that market is that the seller doesn't specify exactly which pools are going to be delivered at settlement. Um, so instead, what's agreed upon is basically six parameters of the trade, which is the agency, the coupon, maturity, price, face value, and settlement month. And then settlement happens once a month for each of these contracts. And, and you know, there's adverse selection here. The seller is basically going to deliver the, the least valuable pools possible that satisfy uh, the, the criteria of the trade and satisfy good delivery guidelines. Um, so this is kind of an interesting trading structure. Uh, um, and, you know, it's interesting that this is such a liquid market despite that adverse selection. Uh, and, and, you know, there's a, a growing literature on this, on this market. And here are some of the papers uh, here. Um, you know, so although this is like where most of the trading activity happens, there's also an, you know, the TBA market coexists with the specified pool market where you basically trade these individual pools rather than just trading in, the, in terms of these cohorts. Um, and there's this uh, Fusari et al paper that's coming out in the JF sort of thinks about the asset pricing implications of the sort of this dual market structure. Um, within the market microstructure literature, there's going to be like fairly ample evidence that uh, TBA trading costs uh, are much lower than other, other MBS or ABS uh, trades, um, um, you know, consistent with this difference in trading volume. Uh, so, for example, this paper by Bessenbinder et al. estimates that one-way trading costs are about one basis point for TBAs, but about 40 basis points for spec pools or CMOs. Uh, and then there's also this kind of interaction effects. Uh, this, this, this paper by Gao et al. kind of argues that TBA liquidity spills over to the specified pool market. So the TBA, uh, the TBA market has sort of benefits beyond, um, beyond the, the market itself. Okay, uh, a little bit about the economic effects of mortgage securitization, uh, just in one minute. Um, so, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of work here um, and, and there's evidence suggesting that, you know, securitization lowers mortgage rates and, and increases credit supply, uh, but on the other hand may create moral hazard uh, by weakening screening and monitoring incentives because, you know, the, the, the originator is not retaining all of the risk on balance sheet. Um, other work kind of thinks about the, the effects of securitization uh, on, on the financial system. Um, so, uh, as David mentioned the last uh, in his discussion, you know, MBS convexity hedging uh, you know, generates volatility in the treasury market. Um, and it also changes the structure of the financial system. So securitization uh, promotes non-bank lending because it basically you know, unties this link between lending and having access to deposit finance. Uh, and within the banking universe weakens the link between lending and bank financial condition. 
Um, other works uh, finds evidence that, that um, securitization affects mortgage design, uh, and, and in particular that the sort of wide availability of fixed rate mortgages in the United States is tied to the to uh, securitization uh, markets. Um, and there's evidence that there are effects of securitization on home prices and home ownership. Um, I'll kind of skip this because I'm out of time. So um, we, we want to sort of finish up just highlighting a few open questions and, and sort of you know, interesting topics for future research. Uh, the first one here is about securitization and alternative mortgage design. So there's been kind of like you know, quite a bit of work proposing alternative mortgage designs that either improve macro stability or have other benefits. Uh, for example, mortgages that where borrowers don't have to explicitly refinance, that the rate you know sort of falls automatically uh, with market rates, is particularly during a rec recession. Um, and so I think there's an interesting question here about you know how does funding work for the, for those kinds of loans, and in particular whether you know the sort of structure of the MBS market kind of locks in the existing designs, right? So we have this equilibrium where this very thick market for 30 years fixed rate mortgages, which is very liquid. Uh, and in some sense, does that kind of then mean that it's hard for, uh, uh, for new mortgages to, to come along because they basically don't benefit from those thick market externalities? Um, you know, other questions, you know, I think that I showed you that the, you know, the, the sort of dwindling uh, of the non-agency market since in the period since the, the Great uh, Recession, you know, I think there's interesting uh, research to be done here about what's limiting that recovery. And particularly the role of regulation. So people kind of highlight the regulations now very tough for non-agency securitizations, and maybe that's the re, you know maybe it's sort of too tough in some in some social sense. Um, uh, kind of in common what they with what David talked about uh, for for treasuries. You know, I think thinking about investor behavior is interesting. For example, MBS. You know, banks really hold a lot of MBS in portfolio now, and in fact, MBS are now fully half of all bank security holdings. Um, so that's quite striking uh, and thinking about what are the effects of that on asset pricing and other things I think is interesting. Uh, I think, you know, the, the, the current mark, uh, literature is fairly US centric. I think there's a lot more work to be done on, on international markets and thinking there's a lot of variation in how mortgages are funded around the world. Uh, I think this is a really interesting topic for research, both thinking about MBS and covered bonds. Uh, and then finally, I kind of mentioned securitization of the environment. So there's kind of this interesting, Fannie Mae has this interesting program uh, of you know, green MBS to kind of encourage retrofitting of buildings and things like that. So uh, I think that's an interesting topic for research as well. So thanks. Thank you, Jim. And Benson will be discussing. Yeah, this, this isn't coming up. Okay, um, great. So um, yeah, look, I uh, I thought this was an exemplary chapter. Um, uh, my job is not to be uh, too good, too gushing. I think I think it's really lucid discussion, which um, is both useful as kind of an introduction if you're completely uninitiated, as well as uh, you know, kind of an update for those of you um, like myself who's you know kind of grasp of this peaked uh, uh, some years ago. So um, I think they did a very good job. Um, and this is a tough topic. I mean, I think um, to do serious research in this, you have to, you know, kind of have a more than rudimentary grasp of not only kind of quantitative finance, but also uh, econometrics. So it's difficult. Um, I just flagged here at the top, you know, kind of what they did uh, in the paper. Uh, I won't go through it again, you know, just a, I think a useful um, overview of the market structure and segmentation, and then, you know, how uh, details on security design uh, useful discussion of uh, the process of um, you know origination to securitization, including some of the downsides of uh, securitization, and then I think as uh, Jim went over um, some of the uh, uh, trading dynamics as well, I think was was very useful. Um, I think we've all as authors kind of struggle with how to organize our chapters. I think um, they did as fine a job as uh, you know as any, and I think it will um, you know kind of uh, depend on the editors <laughs> uh, to sort that out. So I don't have any um, you know strong strong views. But what I will do, I mean, look is uh, look. I mean, I think it was you know very effective exposition, and I you know I think is in any case if we write successful chapters, there will be you know they will intrigue our readers and they'll want even more information. Okay, so what I thought I would do with my 10 minutes is kind of like flag a few things that, you know, if I uh, still worked at the Fed, I'd come down and knock on, you know, David or Andreas or Jim's office and say, hey, well, what do you think about this? Uh, and these might not be necessarily well, well posed, but these are, you know, maybe as a pr practitioner, you know, kind of um, the, the thoughts that I had as I, you know, kind of read the chapter and, you know, kind of wanted what I wanted a little bit more of, maybe not necessarily in the chapter, but you know, I kind of wanted these three authors to, um, you know, maybe help me out with. And, you know, one was prepayment models. And, you know, obviously someone who's, uh, 
not initiated, won't be as interested in the guts. But I do think, you know, one of the things that um, Roberto and I in our analysis of the treasury market is we recognize that the yield curve is its sensitivity to underlying factors, be it inflation or growth or other things, isn't the same today necessarily as it was, you know, 20 years ago or even five years ago. Um, and one of the things we try and build into our models is, you know, that, you know, coefficients are, are dynamic uh, and they change over time. And I do kind of wonder, I mean, kind of given the evolution of this market, the MBS market and the Fed's intervention, if, um, you know, how, how this kind of this type of analysis of changing uh, coefficients, be it moneyness or burnout in these models, um, it has changed over time and it might be uh, particularly apt uh, uh, for this, uh, uh, this market. Um, I was also interested that they flagged that dispersion across OAS models actually matters, right? There's this kind of debate about uncertainty and uh, risk premium, whether or not it raises risk premium or maybe actually uh, lowers risk premium. Uh, there's obviously a paper which um, looks at the dispersion of OAS models and you know, kind of finds that uh, greater dispersion in, in, uh, in prepayment models tends to lead to um, a higher required returns. I also wonder about uncertainty within specific models, right? Because at different times you have different levels of interest rate uncertainty that you know, you're getting different paths for rates and that kind of uncertainty about um, the path of rates by, you, know, you might have a wider distribution of around uh, prepayments, which could uh, could matter actually for, for pricing. So I guess, you know, I wonder about that. And so that's something that I would uh, uh, want to run past them. Um, lastly, yeah, I, I got <laughs> smiled when uh, David mentioned uh, convexity hex hedging uh, in our chapter, and I kind of returned the favor here, right? I kind of wanted to learn a, a little bit more about that and think about how the markets that we're covering uh, interact. And um, I'm sure there's Fed staff that are uh, busy toiling away at this, but I do kind of wonder um, how the impact of convexity hedging has changed, not just with the first um, uh, you know, not in, in the measures and in, uh, in response to the financial crisis, but even those after uh, you know COVID nineteen, how that dynamic has kind of changed uh, these days. Because obviously, you have a huge market participant which does not necessarily have the same uh, uh, is hedging the same uh, risk. Uh, so that would be interesting. Um, the tangent, though, that I'm going to go off on for the remainder of my time is just kind of um, <clears throat> some comments on uh, OAS. Uh, and Jim already showed this picture um, of um, OAS, and I think this is just from, you know, kind of from one, uh, one model. Um, and um, <clears throat> I think um, I would also recommend uh, the paper that uh, uh, David and Andreas and Nina wrote is a great, you know, kind of exposition of, you know, not just kind of where we get these spreads, where they come from, but some of the analysis of both its, the time series and the cross section of OAS. Um, and I take it that, you know, I, OAS should, you know, if, if properly kind of, or formally measured and without error, should not necessarily be less than zero. We shouldn't get negative readings, uh, but we do, <laughs> um, at least with this model. I don't want to make too much of it because I understand that there's model uncertainty, uh, but you know we see a, a negative, uh, uh, reaching negative levels here before QE3. And then maybe it's timely now because it, it looks like a, you know close to a sample low and we're still, I think, underwater right this year, right? So it seems to be you know, kind of timely, uh, uh, timely to think about it. And so, um, you know, I mean, it, it formally, you may not get zero, but you know, there could be market frictions and constraints uh, where you could get uh, negative OAS. And, um, you know, I kind of wonder, uh, <clears throat> wonder how you, how you could get there. And I'm going to kind of maybe go down a rabbit hole in one way that you could get there, <laughs> maybe not successfully. And that is just kind of from a simple uh, cap M lens, right? So how could you possibly get negative OAS? So I think, you know, kind of obviously in, in absolute terms, um, insofar as any asset, um, you know, correlates negatively uh, with consumption growth or uh, the market could conceivably on average uh, command a negative risk premium, right? I mean, you think of insurance, right? That's why we, uh, we pay for home insurance and car insurance and all that other kind of stuff. Um, and so an asset which pays off in states of the world where nothing else does, or few assets do, um, you know, you could observe a negative uh, premium absolute uh, terms. So one way to start just to kind of get uh, a handle on how uh, MBS trade is, uh, what I've got here are <clears throat> uh, 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 MGARCH models of uh, dynamic betas to the S&P for in blue, and I'm just crudely using uh, uh, ETF returns on uh, MBB. Uh, which is an a, a, um, agency mortgage uh, ETF. 
as well as IEF, which is the uh, um, U.S. Treasury ETF for maturities of seven to 10 years. Uh, and then, you know, the first blush, you know, things kind of pass the test in terms of you seeing negative uh, betas to the S&P um, consistently over the sample, uh, and maybe more tellingly in terms of comparisons, uh, even dynamic correlations uh, on a daily basis uh, remain negative between uh, these two ETFs and, uh, and the equity market. Um, there is some variation here, um, uh, which is, is maybe interesting, but on the whole kind of passes the test of, well, at least in this you know, simple, stupid CAPM sense that you, know, you have uh, these assets, which at least hedge you against uh, stock market risk. So you know, kind of in that sense, um, uh, so far so good. But OAS is again a spread over, over treasuries, right? And so um, it has to be that the required returns on MBS you know, have to be actually less than that for uh, um, uh, than treasuries are against the yardstick risky asset class. And indeed, you know, it looks like treasuries are on average doing a little bit better job of hedging equities uh, than MBS do. Um, no real priors for going there, but you know, I have this picture of negative OAS spread, so I'm curious. Uh, and today, you know, most recent part of the sample estimated uh, through Friday is no really difference from uh, before. So it's not as if MBS are doing a uh, more exemplary job of, uh, of hedging, uh, hedging equity risk. Um, last thing I will conclude on is, um, is uh, uh, when we think about this as practitioners, it's not necessarily, uh, you know, kind of the expected value of your hedge, but also the dis full distribution around it, right? So on average, you could expect a hedge, but you may or may not be uncertain about your hedge and your hedge might have a certain type of skew. Um, and one of the, the kind of imperfections of treasuries, I think, is fairly striking. And I was wondering if this also is germane to uh, MBS. I hadn't looked at it before, but the chapter wanted, you know, kind of motivated me to look. Uh, and so what I've got here in red is for the distribution of treasury returns when the stock market does really poorly. OK, and so helpfully for a hedge, this distribution does lie to the right of the origin. OK, so on average, it's you know, uh, it works the way that it, it, it should. Um, but look at this mass to the left of zero. There is substantial probability, um, and this is based on quantile regressions, uh, that you actually uh, lose on your hedge that treasuries actually have negative returns, uh, especially when you don't want them. Uh, but correspondingly, this distribution in green is uh, the return on treasuries when the stock market does really well. And here the return on treasuries is negatively and necessarily, you know, and more observably so, right? Because the distribution is obviously much narrower on the equity downside than it is here um, when, uh, when, when equities do uh, really well. So um, this, you know, I think treasuries to some degree, this is problematic insofar as um, they may on average hedge you pretty well, uh, but on the downside is sort of the opposite of a positively convex hedge because I'm actually pretty uncertain about my insurance. Uh, and this seems kind of hard to square with negative treasury term premiums in some way, right? There might be other reasons, but from this, you know, kind of uh, um, broader distributional sense, uh, a bro you know, more fulsome aspect of a, a hedge, uh, it seems problematic. And just the cut to the chase, I kind of wanted to know what M uh, MBS looked like, right? And I think from the previous page, looking at the MGARCH, uh, MGARCH has had, you know, kind of higher betas. Um, and so, yeah, indeed the distributions here uh, give you less of a hedge, but notably also on the stock market downside, I'm also much more uncertain about how well mortgages uh, hedge me in really, really bad states of the world compared to when stocks do well, um, whereas the MBS distribution is actually kind of narrow. So it was a bit of a rabbit hole, but you know, one was curious in an age where MBS spreads are you know, estimated to be you know, kind of negative or very, very low, um, you could ask, well, okay, are they doing a better job in this kind of, you know, again, more comprehensive uh, view of, uh, of, 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 of convex risk hedges? The answer is no. So I guess my question to them is, you know, kind of where do we look today for, um, you know, kind of more specifically for uh, why required returns might be so low? And it could be, you know, obviously QE is a reason, but, you know, we're starting to wind down now, obviously, right? I, I, I know the authors can't comment on that. Uh, but this persistent level of uh, OAS does seem to be pretty puzzling to me. So, uh, sorry for running over, but I thought it was a great chapter. Thank you, Benson. Uh, I think we've time for one question or comment. Yeah.
If there's nothing, uh, David, do you want to say anything uh, quickly? Or Jim, uh, Jim, sorry, Jim, or well, anyone, any of the authors? David can jump in. Um, thank you, Vincent. This is uh, super uh, interesting. So uh, I think the short of it is you're right. The a negative OIS taken uh, literally is a puzzle in itself. Uh, I'll point out two things. One, uh, measurement issues. Um, so you wouldn't necessarily want to take exactly the level itself. Not, you know, that said, you know, it is it is very compressed. Uh, I said before, I'm not talking about monetary policy, but you can see, you know, gray areas in the prior chart, how they tend to overlap with periods that look like that. So a negative or a, sh a small OIS doesn't necessarily mean that on an adjusted basis, um, the yield is inverting. There is a big option. Uh, 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 there's the option adjustment that takes a lot of that gap. Uh, so I think one obvious interpretation is pressure from one investor in the gray area, as well as other investors that may be reaching for yield. And so that kind of what turns out exposed to compressing that yield. But it, it is, I completely agree, it is, it is a puzzle. And I think we should uh, note that a little bit more explicitly in the chapter. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, we're still keeping on time. Uh, and the next chapter is going to be by Vivian and Bin Wei on, uh, on interest rate swaps. Good. Okay, we see your slides and we hear you, so take it away. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Paul, Rafat, and Jonathan for inviting us to uh, participate in this uh, research handbook on financial markets. Uh, we really uh, are very glad that we have this opportunity to uh, write this chapter on interest swaps. Uh, so my course at Inway uh, is from the Atlanta Fed and uh, I'm at, from Emory. The Euro disclo uh, disclaimer applies. Okay, so uh, so in this chapter, first we will review the fundamentals on um, interest swaps. Uh, so, which is a derivative contract uh, that uh, two counterparties agree to exchange streams of interest payments during the duration of the uh, swap contract. And then uh, in this chapter, we will review several strands of literature on uh, interest swaps, but, uh, in particular in our uh, chapter and in this presentation, we will focus on the three uh, topics. One, the usage of uh, interest swaps uh, by firms. And second, the dynamics of swap spreads. And in particular, there's also one interesting uh, phenomena on the negative swap spread. And lastly, how people have used uh, one type of interest swap, the OIS, to study uh, monetary policy. Okay, so first I will quickly review the fundamentals of interest swaps. Um, so interest swaps, based on uh, the type of uh, uh, interest agreement, so uh, there were three types. So one is the uh, called so-called fixed floating swaps. Um, that are the coupon swaps. The uh, most popular ones are uh, plain vanilla swaps, but also there's one important that I will review uh, later is overnight index swaps. And then if the two parties both receive floating rate of interest, then that's the basis swaps. And lastly, if the stream of payments are in different currencies, then those are the cross currency swaps. So first I'll just show you one simple graph to, uh, to illustrate uh, how the, um, the interest payment uh, works in, uh, this is a plain vanilla fixed floating swap, uh, interest swap. So for the uh, fixed rate receiver, uh, they will receive the fixed interest rate payment uh, according to the swap rate that will be determined according to pricing of the interest swaps. And then they will pay uh, the floating rate linked to LIBOR. And then, uh, then the counterparty is the fixed rate payer. Uh, in the chapter, we also uh, presented examples for basis swaps and cross-currency swaps, as well as how the, uh, the swap rates are priced. Uh, but due to time constraint, uh, we won't go over that. So, uh, and then also I want to show you the, uh, how uh, the popular the interest swap is. This is the most popular uh, interest rate, the, uh, the, the derivative contract that have been used to manage uh, interest-related risk. So um, this graph you see from 1998 to 2000, uh, 2020, the size of swap contract, uh, swap market, the blue line, blue bars are the coupon and basis swaps, and the red bars are the cross-currency swaps. And for comparison, we 
also have the the green yellow greenish bar is the uh, integer options and the FRA uh, of of uh, the 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 all these for comparison. So so you can see the size of the swap market is very big and daily turnover is about four trillion dollars. And in terms of history, the first swap contract was introduced in 1981. It was between uh, the World Bank and uh, IBM. It is cross-currency swap. And since then, the market has uh, vastly uh, developed. And traditionally, the swap contract was treated uh, bilaterally over the counter. And as I said, the plain vanilla introduced swap uh, is the most widely used. And then after 2008, 2009, global financial crisis, there have been some new developments. Um, so first, as uh, all um, many of us know, uh, there's uh, uh, integrity of the LIBOR uh, was called into question. So there'll be no more benchmark LIBOR contracts by the end of this year. Uh, so that could be uh, you know, a new development for especially into the swap uh, market. So now likely the secure overnight financing rate will be the new benchmark rate, but there are also some other candidates uh, under consideration. Um, a second uh, uh, under the uh, Dodd-Frank Act um, and also uh, G20 um, country leaders are agreed to uh, regulate the swap market. So now uh, the, the previously over-the-counter dual contracts now become more standardized and they are treated uh, on exchange or electronic trading platform. And they also require center cleaning, uh, clearing for many of them. And for those who are not center, uh, uh, centrally cleared, then, uh, then the uh, participants face a higher market uh, uh, capital and margin requirements. And they also we also reviewed other um, mandates uh, associated with the new reforms and the regulations over the swap market. Okay, so the participants of introduced swap markets include uh, non-financial corporations, banks, insurance companies, uh, GSEs, asset managers, hedge funds, uh, and intermediaries are uh, broker dealers and central counterparties. And why these participants use introduced swaps? Because um, uh, they use uh, introduced swaps to manage their balance sheets and to hedge, and uh, uh, also they can speculate and time the market. So this is related to the first strand of literature that uh, we review in this chapter. So that the, um, these uh, papers answer the question why firms want to use swaps. So first we review the earliest theoretical studies. So these are theoretical models. Um, uh, one by uh, Tittman, 1992. So they, uh, they show that if there is asymmetric information and the firms have private information about how their borrowing costs will be lower in the future, then these firms want to borrow in short term and then swap uh, the floating for fixed rate. So then that can achieve a lower interest rate cost. And there also have been shown some empirical support for this story. And the uh, second uh, was 1981 paper uh, promote, uh, proposed uh, agency cost story. So because of agency cost, the long-term debt is expensive. So because the firms can, uh, uh, can have a risk uh, shifting. So uh, to reduce the interest cost, the firms actually borrow in short-term debt, uh, which is less expensive and then still uh, become a fixed rate payer by entering a swap contract. So again, there's also some empirical evidence uh, uh, in, from other study. And lastly, uh, another theory that has been proposed is based on the comparative advantage story. Uh, so by uh, Bixler and Chain paper, they show that while well, some firms have uh, more comparative advantage in borrowing a uh, fixed rate and they, some other firms can borrow in long-term rate and then they can uh, trade with each other to cut their cost. Okay. So these are the earlier theoretical studies uh, with some, some empirical support. And then later, because uh, people now get used, uh, get um, the, the firm usage swap usage by firms data set. So uh, and then we can get a more complete uh, uh, picture about the swap usage by the non-financial firms. The first the paper by Lee and Mo, they show that um, the non-financial firms usually pay uh, fixed rates when they enter the swap contract. Uh, 
And uh, in terms of uh, what are the characteristics of these uh, firms who enter swap contract, uh, they find that the swap, uh, these firms usually have a lower credit ratings, they have higher leverage ratios, and uh, they are also more likely to use bank loans than those uh, floating rate payers. And the Falkander uh, has a very important paper in JF 2005. Uh, he looked at, uh, he found that over time, the, the usage of, of the uh, interest swap by firms actually vary with the slope of the yield curve. So if the yield curve uh, is steeper, then the firm wants to um, increase the, their exposure to the uh, floating rate. So it looks like actually those, even though those are the non-financial firms using swap, actually they time the market or they start actually, they do more than hedging, they will speculate. And then lastly, uh, uh, Chenanko and the Falkander 2011 look at both the time series aspects and the cross-section uh, variations in the swap usage, okay? All right, so, uh, and lastly, there are uh, some uh, quantitative studies on the uh, swap usage by non-financial firms. My paper with Urban German, we do build a model with endogenous uh, corporate default and uh, interest swap. And we find that in indeed we can capture these style aspects documented by these empirical papers. Um, and uh, also there's a uh, butcher, um, uh, Schmidt and uh, Wardolium, uh, looking at the uh, swap usage. Okay. So, and then the second strand of literature we look at are about the swap spreads. So swap spread is the difference between the swap rate and the corporate yield. And if you look at a firm who engage in the swap uh, spread uh, transactions, uh, you can see if there is no arbitrage, then the swap spread actually will be equal to the difference between LIBOR rate and the repo rate. So this is the, the cash flow for this, uh, for a, a firm who engage in this, um, uh, long swap spread position. And then if you look at the data, so the blue line here is the two years uh, swap spread and the, uh, the red line is the LIBOR repo spread. We can see that indeed the LIBOR repo spread is can uh, explain well the, these kind of a swap spread at short interest rate, uh, uh, short maturity, and also at the crisis period, they go up. However, if you look at the other maturities, uh, so here we have not only the two year uh, swap spread, but also 10 year and 30 year. So you see there is some uh, kind of a big diff uh, picture after 2008, 2009, and especially for the long maturity uh, swap spread, they become negative. So we review the literatures that can uh, st that study the dynamics of swap spreads. Um, so early studies uh, look at uh, the factors in particular, they uh, decompose the swap spread into uh, the default risk and the liquidity component. The uh, representative works including uh, those by Duffy and Singleton, Liu Long, uh, Longstaff and co-authors. Um, and also some other, uh, factors that have been analyzed uh, to understand the swap spread, including uh, the convenience yield story and uh, the convex, uh, convexity uh, bias by Gupta and the separate menu. Um, and, and other factors that have been used to study the, to explain a uh, swap spread includes um, the panel selection for LIBOR and MBI situation and, uh, and also for the cross-currency cross swap, uh, they, they look at um, the, uh, the dollar Japan into the swaps. Um, uh, so much time I have here. Uh, and, uh, so, and lastly, the collateral, uh, collateralization story on the swap spread dynamics. So I want you can point out another sub, uh, strand of this literature on swap spread is on the phenomenon that the swap spread becomes negative after 2009 for the long maturity uh, interest swap. So uh, to explain this phenomena, we know uh, there's some uh, papers including Urban German's 2020 uh, 
paper where he present a pricing model with transaction cost and to, uh, to show that if there's a limit to arbitrage, and then we can explain the negative swap spread. And uh, Boyan Chanko and Corsairs argued that the regulatory change is, uh, could be uh, the driving force behind the negative spread. And the Klinger and the Sanders and also document uh, uh, the link between the negative swap spread and the pension fund uh, duration hedging. Okay, so lastly, uh, the, the last literature we analyzed uh, in our uh, chapter is to uh, how this uh, OIS swap rate has been used to study the monetary policy. So OIS uh, swap is the swap contract where one counterparty will pay the OIS rate and the other party pay the average of the effective federal fund rates. So then this rate uh, can be thought as the um, expected federal fund rates over the lifetime. So here, this is the picture of the uh, three months LIBOR OIS spread. So, um, so therefore following, uh, uh, Kuttner's 2001 paper and uh, Rafael and Kors's paper. So actually OIS rate changes in OIS rate also have been used in the literature to as a proxy for uh, surprises in the monetary policy. And so uh, in the literature, uh, like Woodford have looked at uh, US, Canada and Sweden, uh, Dross and the Kors are look at the England, uh, uh, Bank of England and uh, Abes uh, and uh, Linzer look at uh, ECB. Uh, so these papers have all used the changes in US uh, rate to study uh, the effectives of monetary policy. And, the, uh, and the, uh, another paper that um, uh, Otavila uh, 2019 and Corsa 2019 paper construct a, a data set that includes also OLS to measure uh, the monetary policy changes. Okay, so then lastly, so the, those are the three strands of literature that we review in the chapter and looking forward, we think uh, so uh, the future research we probably we need to more uh, to understand the use of introduced swaps and the general equilibrium effect of these swap usage. Uh, because just based on my paper with urban uh, and uh, related really quantitative works, it looks like we need uh, some other theory to explain, uh, to understand the impact on the macroeconomy. And another interesting uh, uh, future uh, avenue of research we think are uh, to link the dynamics of swap spread with the regulatory changes. Okay, thank you, that's all. Okay, thank you very much. And the discussant will be Salim Bahaj. No, actually it's gonna be Good me, Ricardo. Ricardo. That's fine. Okay, sorry, the discussant will be Ricardo. Sorry, Salim is working tomorrow, so you guys are stuck with me for this. Um, he'll be presenting our paper. Oops. Okay. Good. Okay. Well, pleasure to discuss this. Um, I thought it would be more useful than, pro well, um, I think the most useful thing for the editors would be if I provide a referee report, but I decided not to be all that useful to them. So I already gave my comments and referee report to the authors. And instead, I thought I'd use the 10 minutes to be more useful instead to the audience insofar as thinking of what are some of the um, important questions that I think remain in this area after you've read the very thorough uh, chapter. Um, the chapter, as with many of the chapters in this conference, describes quite thoroughly and accurately how interest rate swaps work, the mechanics of the contracts, and surveys and um, yeah, surveys some of the literature on some of the questions that it has asked. I thought this chapter ends there a little bit beyond the, the last slide that Vivian showed on some open questions. I thought my most useful contribution would be to expand on her last slide and tell you a bunch of more, I think, interesting open questions on which these data or just generally interest rate swaps would motivate. So I'm gonna use my nine minutes in with five questions that I think are open important challenges for some of the researchers in the literature. First, there's a striking graph on the increase in the size of the interest rate swap market. Um, the market has increased, volume, this is in terms of notionals. You could also look in terms of trading volume of them, very related of course, in terms of swaps since they're over the counter, but, an important open question is, why don't I see more of a relation between this and the underlying fundamental? What do I mean by this? Between 2012, 17, arguably plus minus a year, I think what can arguably say that interest rate uncertainty 
up to one or even two year horizon was incredibly low in the United States. We had forward guidance um, and a fairly committed central bank on forward guidance. Therefore, the desire to trade interest rate risk, which we think is in part driven by different beliefs about whether interest rates will move or not, should have been historically quite low, at least relative to the usual. And yet it is hard to see, certainly in a figure like this, whether there is any particular change in the volume of notion interest rate swaps. Partly this happens because this is of course the total quantity and it would be useful to see this broken by the maturity or the tenor of the contract. But it would be quite interesting, if not even downright puzzling, to see a gigantic enorm of notional three month or one year interest rate swaps during a period where the interest rate was incredibly flat and with little uncertainty around it. More generally, I think we need to break, start breaking this figure, which is very hard um, because again, the data is often provided in this very aggregate way by the Bank for International Settlements by maturity and by date. So I don't think Vivian can do this for the paper. <coughs> and that's why I leave it as challenge for future research. But for us to understand this beyond noting, well, there was no market, now there was a market. This is a market in which we had dramatic regime changes in across time in the last 20 years in the volatility under the underlying fundamental of this derivative. And as a result, we should see something about the size of the market and those fundamentals. <coughs> Apologies. <coughs> Second important question. Vivian and Bay note very clearly in the paper the conventional and correct story that we think of pension funds holding a lot of uh, risk insofar as they have promises in the very long run that they need to satisfy. And given their investments with potentially risky returns, who want to engage in swaps in order to match volatility, in order to match uh, liabilities and assets in terms of the, their promised payments. And likewise with banks, insofar as we think about them as borrowing short and investing long, creates again, a very clear desire to fix some interest with payments in terms of the corporate bonds that they issue to supplement the uh, deposits they issue. Those two are classic cases, which are very well explained in the chapter, but they leave one still wondering who's holding interest rate risk once one, once one combines, um, uh, once one looks at the market as a whole. It's still quite striking how we have very incomplete data to understand who's long and who's short, if you want, who's holding interest rate risk because ultimately, interest rate risk is a nag at risk, not an idiosyncratic risk. It doesn't get diversified away in some pool. For someone to sell it, someone has to hold it. And as a result, after the distribution of these interest rate swaps, where does the risk end up in the last place? I am particularly influenced here by a paper which really opened my eyes or changed my view. There's only a few of those every so often that I saw many years ago uh, by Julian Beganau, Monica Pezes, and Martin Schneider that show that if you consolidate banks' balance sheets with their interest rate exposure, you may end up with, depending on the bank you look at, completely backwards view on whether banks, on whether an increase in interest rates is a negative or a positive to banks and an expected increase in interest rates uh, in terms of net income. It actually depends, it can completely revert relative to what our conventional wisdom is of what banks are. This work is really, in my view, desperately needed. And for that, we need balance sheet data because at this point, from a, both a policy or a theory perspective, precisely because of the large volume in the swap market, it has become very unclear who's holding, uh, who's holding the interest rate risk. That is, if the Fed or the ECB were to suddenly hike up interest rates, who would actually be the winners and the losers um, in these markets? Uh, that is a work that I think is sorely missing in this literature and which is both important from a policy perspective as well as an economic perspective, both just within this market and especially as in the work of Beg and Opus, as in Schneider, integrated with other positions in the balance sheet. Third and related, uh, there's been an exciting work. I think I can't forget now who it was. I think it was David a little while ago that uh, very flattering and adequately described the work of my colleague uh, Dimitri Vianos on preferred habitats and how influential that has been on our understanding of bond markets and the effects of quantitative easing. But note, if Oh, but note, and note, let me argue it's even more interesting and influential. If we think that preferred habitats, the stories in, in Dimitri's work uh, with by now a series of different co-authors across different papers are important, 
then they should reflect themselves not just in who's holding treasure different securities, but also on the positions that those different agents want to take in the interest rate in the swaps market. That is, the swaps data provides precisely the over-identifying restrictions if one wants with which to test the preferred habitats model. It provides us precisely with a confirmation of whether it is habitats or something else that are driving the seeming arbitrage opportunities across different maturities. Do we see in the swaps data what we observe there? And I think combine the swaps data with the holding, the holding of swaps, with the holding of bonds in a structural empirical model that matches both positions on bonds and swaps would be absolutely the next step on this literature. If we're all going to embrace that the mechanism of QE um, is because of desires to hold interest rate risk at different maturities or horizons, translating itself into certain bond positions, then boy, here we have a great test. Let's look at the swaps data. Do we see those same guys taking those positions or not? And I think that would be potentially extremely important. Fourth, who should hold this risk? I told you, let's measure who holds the risk. Does who hold it allow us to test it? But <coughs> from a perspective of a theory, who should hold interest rate risk? It's an aggregate risk. Now, a simple perspective is whomever is the person uh, that is least risk averse should hold all of the risk. That's a clear theoretical prediction. Um, or should hold at least most of the risk. I'm sorry, not all the risk, unless there's someone risk neutral. But secondly, on account of their natural um, fundamentals of their activity, firms, banks, pension funds, households, who is the natural holder of interest rate risk in the economy? Or is the natural holder of risk the taxpayer via the government? There's actually very little work on the theory of asking this somewhat fundamental question. There is an aggregate risk in the economy. Who is the natural buyer and who's the natural seller of that? Again, we have some, I think, fairly rudimentary intuitions about banks and pension funds, which I've already described. It would be good to develop the theory of who actually should hold this risk and then contrast that with what we observe in the swaps data and map that especially to the movements in the swap rates reflecting supply and demand that Vivian says we should. Finally, fifth in my minus 30 seconds. Um, are those, um, are the companies, sorry, investors that are swapping out interest rate risk, are they also swapping at the same time out in or neither inflation risk? The next paper is going to be about how we trade inflation options. That market is not as big as the, um, as the interest rate swaps and options market, but it is grown quite considerably. And the, eight, the same players in the interest rate market are some of the same that are in the inflation risk market, a market that I've also written by now a few papers on. Um, if we had data on joint positions, and again, some theory on whether do you want to hold, uh, who should hold the risk separated by real interest rate risk versus inflation risk, that would go to uh, a fundamental questions um, in economics as well as in policymaking. And I think... Hope, I hope that in combined that data, that would be a next uh, step in this agenda. So thank you. This is a great paper by Vivian. I thought I think these are some of the challenges that will come after um, and that are important in this lecture. I'll stop there. Thank you, Ricardo, for a great discussion. Uh, Angelo has a question. Hi, Vivian. <clears throat> thank you very much for uh, this interesting paper. Um, I skimmed over your paper. I haven't seen really a discussion about the XVA, the valuation adjustment. And to my understanding, this is really important nowadays in, in pricing interest rate swap. And second, also now in many jurisdictions and for many um, financial firms, it's mandatory central clearing, right? <clears throat> and, uh, and indeed, I, 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 I took the liberty to send you a paper where you show empirical evidence that is uh, actually an OTC premium uh, if an interest rate swap is not centrally cleared. And, and on top of that, also provide evidence about the XV, XVA impact on, on this um, instrument. Are there any other questions or comments? With that. I quickly note, this goes to Ricardo's uh, discussion too. Um, balance sheet information for uh, the purpose of inc incorporating 
swap related stuff too won't be sufficient um, for many of the interesting questions. And it's a question in its own right that, uh, you know, whether these, whether information on these off balance sheet items get priced in, uh, in terms of bank or any other corporation's valuation, the same way as on balance sheet items. That is, uh, you know, I could, it could be on my, on my balance sheet, uh, how much interest rate exposure I have or I don't have. Um, or I could be doing this with swaps and it would be off balance sheet. And whether I get punished or rewarded the same way, either way, uh, by the market is an interesting question on its own right. Vivian, do you or Ben, do you want to reply to anything for just like 60 seconds? Yeah, no, uh, thank you very much. Uh, first, uh, Angela, uh, uh, I got I just got your uh, paper, uh, the paper you sent to me. I will read it uh, carefully and I uh, really uh, appreciate your comment. Uh, uh, so uh, we, when we revise the paper, we should uh, also uh, discuss uh, the dimension. And I want to thank Ricardo for a, a very insightful discussion. Uh, so all the five directions of the future research are really spot on. So you know, we scratch our head a little bit. <laughs> Can we think about the, what go, comes next? We, because also we want to do more future research on in this uh, topic. But we, uh, we appreciate your uh, suggestion. Bin? No, I don't have answer. Yeah. Okay, all right, that's all, yeah. thank you. Thank you very much. So Ricardo actually provided a nice segue into the next uh, chapter, which is on inflation hedging products. And I think Stefani is going to present. Can we see you your hear slides? me? And can you yep, see me? Hear you and we see your slides. Yep. Okay, perfect. So this is a chapter um, that I wrote jointly with uh, Thomas King. And um, the usual disclaimer apply because we both work at the Chicago Fed. And in particular, this discussion is not going to contain any information about current, and future, and monetary bodies. Um, I'm very grateful to Refet and Jonathan for giving us the opportunity to participate in the end book. And uh, it's so great to see all of you. OK, so I'm just going to give you a brief overview of what is going to be in the chapter. So we try to address a simple question. So what is the efficacy and cost of simple inflation edging strategies in the UN financial market, okay? And our premise is that there is no one size fits all edge uh, because different investor may have different inflation edging objectives. So uh, as a consequence, we try to relate each asset inflation edging ability to multiple inflation measures. So we will focus on the CPI, its component, PC, PPI, wage inflation, and, and for many of these measures, we will look at headlining core, okay? So another important premise is that uh, we think that, um, you know, we have a simple framework to try to motive, organize our idea, and we show that for each investor type, the inflation risk originate from the gap between asset and liability inflation rates, okay? So we we'll try to focus at the very end on the on strategy that perform well against both type of inflation in a bunch. So more importantly, we also show uh, by reviewing the literature how uh, the empirical evidence, how the inflation risk has changed over time has been evolving from inflation risk to this, this inflation risk. And of course, this has affected the relative attractiveness of the different inflation edging instruments, in particular nominal bonds. And, uh, and so overall, it shows that their inflation edging ability depend on a composite growth inflation regime, okay? And all of this is reflected in the cost of the inflation edge, which is the inflation risk premium. And so we see that this one also has been varying in size and sign over time. So we consider, we try to consider a wide range of assets, okay? And in particular, we start with the, what the literature called the real assets. So these are assets whose values is more directly linked to physical assets. So we have equity, commodity, real estate, and so, for example, for equity, we, con con we 
consider the usual broad indices, but also their subsector and the former French factors. And for uh, commodity in commodities, we also consider the broad commodity index, like uh, the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index and the Bloomberg Commodity Index, and also all spot in future prices and natural grass, precious metals like gold and silver and key agricultural goods. And for real estate, we're gonna consider the case Schiller price index and the Wilshire REIT index. Then we will go to real bonds. And since we're focusing on the US, we just consider treasury inflation protecting security or TIPS. Then we also go to currency and the rationale for considering currency is the purchasing power parity. So when the US inflation goes up, the purchasing power of the dollar decline and therefore the foreign currency appreciates. Another rationale is uh, to focus on currency of emerging markets that are commodity exporter. And so in this case, uh, when the prices of the major commodity export goes up, the currency appreciates. So for example, this year, the Russian rubble, South African rand and Brazilian real have been doing very well because the commodity export, uh, the price of commodity export has been going up. And then we consider nominal bonds, in particular, we focus on treasury security with maturity from one month to third year. And we will consider both rolling returns and all imperial returns from one month to third year. Uh, so what are the key findings? Okay, so over the last uh, 20 years, so this is the more recent sample that we analyze. Uh, we find that many assets are quite successful in edging headline inflation, okay? But this is mostly because they're quite good at edging energy prices. But instead, uh, edging core inflation is much harder, and in particular, to edge PPI core is almost impossible, especially at short horizon. Okay, and in particular, the reason why it's so hard to edge core inflation is because it's hard to find a decent edge for CPI services. And this is because these are dominated by labor costs. And so the problem, or at, at the source of the problem is that it's very hard to edge wage inflation. So um, inflation risk, as I mentioned, uh, has, evolved from, uh, uh, has evolved from inflation risk to this inflation deflation risk over the last decade, except for the last year. And this, of course, has made <laughs> nominal bonds a good inflation instrument, okay? Because they've been delivering higher return when the investor needed the most. And uh, this is clearly reflecting the inflation risk premium nominal bonds that has been very low or even turning negative, which practically reflects the attractiveness of these of the nominal bonds. While instead, inflation risk premium for equity has been going from negative to positive. So let's think about this simple network framework that we're using to organize ideas, okay? So um, the idea is that each investor wants to protect the real value of expected future net worth, okay? So they will be discounting nominal cash flow, so the, the, the cash flow they receive and pay uh, using the nominal present kernel or, or nominal discount factor, depending if you are macro or more financing person. And, um, and uh, of course, the real cash flow will be discounted using the real pricing kernel, okay? And you can see that the real pricing kernel is indexed by I, so will depend on the investor and uh, uh, because in practically the type of inflation that you need to wedge will depend on the type of investor that you are. If you are a household, uh, uh, then you will be worried about CPI and wage inflation, okay? But if you are a firm, you might be worried about input and output inflation, okay? And, uh, and so overall, minimizing inflation risk will mean to minimize the weighted difference of asset and liability prices. Okay, so, but how do we measure uh, empirically the um, each asset inflation edging ability? So to measure it, uh, since we're using simple correlation between the nominal price of the asset and each measure of actual inflation, okay? A short horizon is quite easy, but a long horizon, it becomes, if you wanna con consider long investment horizon, it becomes more complicated because in our, even in our longest sample, this starts in 72, the raw data would allow only to have um, five non-overlapping objectives, okay? So the way we do it is that for each pair, so to avoid this problem of the, 
uh, overlapping observation, we are going to use, um, we're going to model each pair of uh, inflation index and asset price using Varima model, okay, in log levels. And then we will, we will use this model to project the correlation at the horizon from one month to 30 years, okay? And in particular, um, for each pair, we're going to search across uh, the, uh, the number of lag between 0 and 12 months and the number of moving average terms between 0 and 3, and we will use the Akaka information criteria to select the best model. Then we will simulate 1 million observations and compute the correlation. So the result for headline inflation uh, indicate that uh, um, usually assets that are strongly related to food and energy price perform very well with all the headline measure. And this is because food and energy price account for most of the variation in headline inflation. So in particular, broad commodity index and oil future have correlation of at least 70% at six months horizon and beyond. And also energy related stock like oil and gas production, oil and gas equipment do pretty well at longer horizon. And the emerging market currency also been providing some protection, okay? Also the cash yield index has done well and, uh, and real estate in general. And uh, also the short term and medium term tips have been providing some protection against CPI, okay? But it really depends on, on, on horizon. Long-term nominal bonds of correlation instead have been negative ex ex except for the one month TV, okay? And uh, post 1999, differently from the long sample, gold has been a bad edge for headline inflation. Results for core, as I was mentioning, two edge core is much harder, okay? Especially at short horizon. So the only asset that provides some protection was tips. And uh, again, it depends on the horizon, but in particular, 10-year tips um, was doing quite well between three months and one year horizon, okay? And the two-year tips are one month horizon. The, co the correlation of tips with PC were even lower and with PPI negative. Uh, at longer horizon, there are also some other uh, assets that perform decently with core. And, um, and uh, so, to core PCE behaves more similar to PCE, so it is easier to edge along the horizon. And for core CPI, on top of tips, we also have the two and five year nominal bond rolling return, some of the Fama French factor, and again, real estate. Um, and for the core PPI, only the th third year nominal bond rolling return and the case Schiller were offering some protection. And again, gold and most stock market index with core measure have negative correlation, so they, they don't provide any edge. In the case of the different component of consumer and producer inflation index, okay, again, two, uh, two edge CPI and durable, since it's dominated by food and energy price, it, it, it's, it's quite easy. It's, it's, it, like the correlation were very similar to headline CPI, okay? In the case of durable, since also the pass-through of energy cost is very high to durable, uh, in general, broad commodity index and oil future were performing quite well, okay? And even some sector of the stock market, such as metals mining, financial and insurance. In the case of CPI services, instead very few assets offer some protection, in particular, the two-year nominal bond rolling return and one monthly bill, and again, the case shiller pricing, okay? And tips in some cases. So the problem is that the weak, so this signal that the weak correlation with core CPI stems from the lack of good edge for prices in the services, okay? And again, uh, nominal bonds and also have very low correlation and also negative with, uh, with core CPI, okay? Uh, in, so in, in the case of wages and house prices, um, uh, we find that most of the assets display negative correlation with average hourly earnings, which is our measure of wage inflation, okay? And the only exception were very short-term nominal treasury security, like the one monthly bill and two-year nominal bonds, and also uh, only the 10-year nominal bonds if held to maturity, okay? And also tips could provide some protection, okay? So again, one possible reason for why it is hard to to edge core inflation and CPI service, service inflation is precisely the fact that it's very hard to edge labor costs. 
Um, so in the case of house prices, it's that like many assets perform quite well. And in particular, um, most component of the stock market, if I'm a French factor and commodity and some currency were working well. So what are the implications for, if we think in the, in the setup of the simple framework that we presented, well, in the case of also balance sheet, then what will work well, because we would be able to edge both headline CPI and average our earning return, meaning the, the asset and the ability inflation would be short-term nominal treasury security and the case shiller price index. Okay? This would be also working well for firm in the service sector. Okay? And for firm that are not in the service sector, then very robust edge like uh, broad commodity index and oil future will protect well both against input and output inflation. And instead, if the investor is mostly focused on core inflation, then what might work well are, are tips over short horizon and the 25 year nominal bond rolling return and some of the FAMA French factor and the case Schiller prices for longer horizon. So turning to the cost of inflation edge, so what do we mean for the cost of inflation edge? This would be the return that investor willing to forego to hold inflation edge, okay? Also known as the inflation risk, okay? Uh, it is natural to start from the inflation is premium embedded in the nominal term structure because the literature has been developed in very sophisticated dynamic structure model to extract inflation is premium, but there also been a lot of progress in how to extract inflation is premium from stock returns and from other asset classes. Returns, okay, so we start from dynamic term structure model, and usually in this model, inflation is premium is obtained as the difference between the nominal yield, the real yield, and the inflation rate. And with some math, it's possible to show that the inflation is premium is mostly driven by the covariance between the real price in kernel and inflation, and plus a Jensen inequality term, but that is very small and we're gonna ignore it, okay? So under the simple assumption that the, the nominal, the real price in kernel is mainly driven by the real deal, okay? It's possible to simplify this and show that the inflation is premium is mainly driven by the covariance between the real rate and inflation. And this is what the, the literature has been usually analyzing in, uh, in analyzing the, the property of the edging property of stocks and nominal bonds. This is practically the nominal real covariance. Okay. And so this is the object that drives inflation risk premium across all the assets. So, and there is a lot of evidence that the nominal real covariance has been flipping sign in the early 2000s from uh, has been becoming positive, okay? And, and, uh, and uh, has becoming positive. And so this implies that, um, and this is due to the fact that demand shock have been dominating the last 10 years. And in this type of uh, environment, in, when, when demand shock dominates, and so there is a positive correlation between inflation and real yields, then, uh, nominal bonds tend to do very well, right? Because they pay off in deflationary scenario, so they pay, they provide high real return when investors need it the most, okay? And as such, they will command a negative inflation risk, very low or negative inflation risk. Okay? So this is reflecting estimates from many uh, dynamic term structure models, okay? That are augmented with measure of inflation or with measure of inflation edge, such as, such as inflation swaps and tips. So one example is the time series that I'm showing here uh, from my model with Thomas Bridge and Athanasius Orphanides, which is a very flexible model that can adjust to very different type of um, composite growth inflation regime. And so it's possible to see how I, I, in the early 80s, inflation risk premium was very high because these were period dominated by high inflation expectation, high actual inflation and high inflation uncertainty. And then post 2000, the inflation risk premium has been very low as uh, the credibility of the Fed increased and inflation expectations stabilized and then after the global financial crisis, it start becoming negative. And in the last year, dominated by the deflation bias, meaning the fact that um, the Fed was not able to eat the 2% and inflation keep falling rather than stabilizing, inflation risk premium has been very low, negative. So if we turn to the, the measure of the uh, also inflation risk in other stocks, uh, so then um, we have the paper from Boone et al. And they show 
that the, the inflation risk premium in stock also has been changing over time and it from, from negative becoming positive. So the opposite of the inflation risk premium nominal bonds after the early 2000s. Okay, so here we describe how, how they obtain. And so they find that is also driven by the nominal real covariance. And if this nominal real covariance increased by one standard deviation, the inflation risk premium is going to increase by three to four percent, and it gets larger as the investment horizon gets longer. Okay, and so they show that uh, from the 60s to the early 2000s was uh, mostly negative, and it was monotone decreasing in the inflation data. So investors were willing to give up return to all the stock portfolio. They were more exposed to inflation, and then post 2002 became the opposite. Okay, and so this is precisely consistent with the flipping sign in the nominal real world. Finally, uh, Fang, Liu, and Rossuno also do it for other asset classes. Okay, but very interesting, they analyze the inflation risk relative to headline energy and core, and so they find that the only core inflation uh, carry a negative and significant uh, price of inflation. Okay, in particular, they add, and this is true across many asset classes. And in particular, they find more or less that if the asset exposure to core inflation increased by one unit, then the investor is going to require about 1% of excess return per annum. Okay, so this shows one more that as with assets, there is not one size fits all strategy for edging inflation, there is not also a unique inflation risk premium. Each asset has its own inflation risk. Okay, so in general, what this tells us about future research? Well, it seems that it would be interesting if uh, research evolves towards analyzing inflation edging across different dimensions, different as measure, different assets for different investors, and uh, import also in across different investment horizons. And also um, some of the points that Ricardo raised about who should be the nature holder of inflation risk. Uh, then also would be interesting to think about if the government and therefore taxpayers should be the national older inflation risk through TIPS, or uh, if um, private investors to inflation derivatives should all the inflation risk. This is especially in light of the fact that over the last year, the market for inflation derivative has been drying up a lot. Yep. Thank you very much, Stefan. Uh, and the discussant will be Shane Sherland. All right, Jonathan, can you hear me okay? I can hear you, yep. Okay, let me share my screen super quick. All right, so uh, I'm Shane Sherland. I work at the Federal Reserve Board, so as such, I, I need to give the this, this disclaimer. Um, so anything I say today is uh, my own opinion and doesn't reflect that of the board or the, the board governors or um, or the uh, or its staff. Um, furthermore, it's FOMC week, so you know I'm not allowed to talk about monetary policy issues or anything along those lines. Um, so I've been asked to uh, just give a brief discussion of the chapter by Stefania and Thomas on inflation hedging products. Um, so I'll just uh, I'll go through this pretty quickly and try to get us um, back on time. All right. Uh, so this paper was really, really cool. Um, you know, you turn on the news nowadays, you hear all kinds of, of interesting things. Um, one of the things that comes up lately has been inflation. Um, so I think this chapter is actually very topical. Um, and in particular, the chapter um, discusses optimal inflation hedges, um, you know, kind of how to think about it. It's not something I've thought about a lot in the past. Um, so I actually found the chapter very good. It was well written. I learned a lot. Um, and I just, I, I just thought it was a really nice piece. Um, so in the end, what I learned is that optimal inflation hedging depends on the type of price exposure that a, um, you know, a consumer or a firm or, a, or an investor has, um, the time horizon over which you're trying to hedge um, price changes. Um, and then it, there's also a lot of sensitivity um, you know, on the performance of a, of a particular hedge um, across time. So it just depends on the nature of demand shocks and, and stuff like that on, on what's actually causing the type of inflation. Um, so one interesting aspect is so if you think about a consumer, a firm, or an investor, is you know all of these things have incomes and expenses and assets and liabilities, um, and the CPI and PPI really only measure one part of that. It's it's not this all-encompassing you know price measure. Um, so when we think about the CPI or PPI, it's 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 just a part of the equation. 
Um, so if you think about, you know, a household or something like that, you know, they also face um, wage um, deflation risks. Um, you know, you have price changes on assets and liabilities. Um, you have nominal debt contracts. You have all this stuff that, that kind of interacts um, in ways that are not completely captured by the CPI and PPI. Um, so jumping kind of into the, the paper, um, so the you know, the, the literature in the paper, the, the paper did a lot of empirical work, which I thought was really nice. Um, and it, it largely confirms what the what the literature shows. Um, so basically, commodities hedge headline inflation fairly well. Um, a lot of that is just driven by the high correlation with energy prices. Um, and as a result of that, you know, other energy related assets um, also serve as, as relatively good hedges for inflation risk. Uh, core Inflation turns out to be a little bit more difficult to hedge. Um, of course, tips um, and real estate do fairly well over long periods of time, uh, but in the very, very near term, we're you know, thinking of time periods of a year or less, um, it, it, it's really hard to, to, um, to hedge core inflation. Um, now that said, core inflation doesn't really jump around that much in the short term, but um, you know, if you're trying to, to hedge that, that type of risk, it's hard to do. Um, and then the paper shows that um, in terms of producer prices and wages, those are actually the most difficult parts of the inflation puzzle to hedge, um, although real estate provides some, some protection there. Uh, so several other facts that, uh, that I found interesting in the paper. Um, so since the financial crisis, um, disinflation risk has dominated inflation, inflation risk. Um, so Stefania showed that by showing that the inflation risk premium had, had moved negative. Um, and that's that's basically been since the financial crisis. Um, prior to that, it was actually quite positive and, and very substantially positive. Um, you know, and that just kind of I, I think it just points to the market's perceptions of whether it's an inflationary risk or a deflationary risk. Um, and I think the, the paper did a good job of, of spelling that out. Now, one fact I didn't know and I found this really cool is that precious, met precious metals um, serve as a, you know, it's kind of the, the conventional wisdom that precious, precious metals to provide a decent hedge to inflation. Um, you know, if you look at the, the data um, since 1972, that turns out to be true. Uh, but if you look at data from 1999 on, it actually turns out not to be a very effective hedge against inflation. Um, so that we're thinking about things like gold and silver. Um, so, you know, some of us might want to think about how we, how we do our portfolios. Um, so I had basically three questions and comments that I just kind of wanted to bring up. Um, you know, I think some of this will ultimately be up to the editors to decide, but it's, it's just kind of things to think about. Um, so as I read through the chapter, one of the things I was really thinking about is I, I found it surprising that there wasn't really a, like a, a futures market or a financial instrument that kind of did this already. Um, so if you think about headline inflation risk, you have tips, securities. Um, but if you're thinking about like the PPI or something like that, um, you know, a gap between the CPI and the PPI, things like this, um, there's not really this explicit thing that you just go out and buy. You have to construct like a portfolio. Um, you know, you can use stocks, energy related shocks, currencies, you know, but you, you've got to construct it. Um, and that might be because of the idiosyncratic nature of inflation risk that, you know, firms, households and, um, and uh, investors face. Uh, but that's that's one thing that I was just kind of thinking about, you know, is, is you know, is there a market for that? Um, and, you know, how much how much is it kind of worth in a sense? Um, so that's that's kind of that's like the second question is, um, you know, real estate kept, kept coming up as a as a relatively good hedge against various types of inflation risk. Um, so I, I do a lot in the in the mortgage and housing markets. And, you know, there's this there's this house price futures um, market. Um, where, you know, it's based on the S&P Case-Shiller house price indexes. And there's this composite index, which basically you should just think of as the United States as a whole. Um, and then it's also got 10, you know, of the big metro areas, New York City, LA, um, places like that. Um, and what it is, is it's basically daily futures prices um, for quarter end index values on the S&P um, index. So kind of the question I had is, you know, can we use that futures market? Is, you know, is there any predictive power there um, for inflation hedging? Or is it really just the S&P Case-Shiller Index itself, kind of that contemporaneous correlation um, that's driving that result? 
Uh, the final comment I have um, relates to the, the tables at the, the end of the paper. Um, so they're they're really long. Um, you know, there's a lot of information in there. You know, there's there's probably thousands of numbers, um, and I, I I totally get why the author do that. Um, I probably would have done it the same way. Um, so I was the the question is basically is there a better way to portray, portray the correlations? Um, you know, you know I I couldn't think of anything really good. Um, but you know, one thing that you might think about is you know, just look across the inflation measures. And if the results kind of look the same from one inflation measure to the next, maybe, you know, you, you fold them up into one and maybe put it into a footnote. Or if there's different financial assets that are kind of giving, you know, zero results or results that aren't very significant, you know, maybe you just drop those and put those into a footnote as well. So something just to kind of focus a little bit more on the, on the meaningful results, I think might be helpful. So Thank you very much. Thank you Jonathan, so much for muted. your comment. All well taken. Jonathan, you are muted. Sorry. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, we have time for one question, and Ricardo got his hand up. So please okay. go ahead. Sorry, Stefan, but I'm very confused about your big point about the inflation risk premium differing across asset classes. Because in the paper you define the inflation risk premium, the only equation I saw was yield on a nominal bond minus a real bond on a certain horizon minus expected inflation. So I saw from the OAS, there's lots of inflation risk premium depending on the horizon and how you measure the expected inflation because the two are measurable. But you instead meant, oh no, there's lots of inflation risk premium because if I calculate through this procedure where I calculate a bait in the cross section and separate idiosyncratic and not, I get different numbers, but could you tell me like, what's the equation that's, that means that that's also risk premium that matches definition on the previous equation? I just don't understand what it means. There's an inflation risk premium in different assets because you didn't define that new object. So could you define it formally and tell me how it relates to the one that you did define? I'm just very confused. Apologies for having a confusing question. So, so the, the equation that I, I show is only for nominal bonds. So I, 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 what's I, the I other one? I, I agree. I know that one. So what's the one for the other asset classes? So I can link it to this one and see where they're different. No, I, I just de de describe how it empirically they derive it, but the concept is the, is How the can same. you the measure something of... that you haven't defined? First define it and then you empirically measure it. But what's it defined to be? I just don't understand what it is. Just, uh, sorry, I just don't know what it is. I mean, you, you tell me how so you measure it, but what is it? The, the, the quantity of risk is measured in the same way, is, is still the, 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 um, the inflation beta of each asset. So, so is their exposure to inflation? So is the covariance between the return and inflation? So that is the quantity of risk. And then in the cross section, by running cross section of individual stock return on their own inflation beta, which is the proxy of the quantity of risk, you can get the, the price of risk in okay. the stock returns. I, I think I think we should hold it here so as to keep things on time. Oh, yeah. uh, so, sorry, David. We, we we can we can have continued questions by by chat, but we're already a little over, and I don't want to uh, go further over. So uh, the next chapter is on government agencies. Great, thank you. And I am trying to share my screen. There you go. Hi, yeah, I'm Jill. Great. I am Jillian Burgess, and together with my colleagues Wayne Passmore and Shane Sherlin from the Federal Reserve, we drafted the, the chapter on government agencies. Just a quick disclaimer, the views and opinions expressed herein and in the chapter are ours alone and do not necessarily reflect those of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System, its members, or its staff. Now I will also speak at a normal speed. There we go. So um, government agencies, we focused on Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, also referred to as the Government Sponsored Enterprises or GSEs. These two firms are corporations that were created by and regulated by the US federal government. Both of them failed in 2008 and have been in government conservatorship ever since. The GSEs are often overlooked in studies of the mortgage market, even though they dominate the, the US mortgage market. Both firms purchase residential mortgages from originators, pool many of those loans, and then sell mortgage-backed securities backed by those pools. The, 
uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac being such unique firms in the US financial system, uh, a lot of understanding the, the research and financial economics related to them depends on first understanding what they are, why they're unique, and the history of how we got there. So our chapter in this presentation will we'll follow uh, a similar structure of looking first at the GSE charter, how the GSEs affect the US mortgage markets, and then the special status of the GSEs and efforts to reform the GSEs. The GSE charters are very similar. They were both created by statutes of Congress and must be amended by statutes of Congress. They provide for four main purposes of each firm. One, to provide stability in the secondary market, market for residential mortgages, to respond appropriately to private capital mar markets, to provide ongoing assistance to, the sec assistance to the secondary market for residential mortgages through liquidity and capital availability. And both charters specifically uh, call out including activities related to low and uh, medium income housing and to promote access to mortgage credit nationwide. How do these firms affect the US mortgage market? Both firms guarantee the timely payment of principal and interest on the mortgage-backed securities backed by high quality conforming mortgages. The securities and the firms are not explicitly backed by the US government. The GSEs engage in credit risk transfers private capital market transactions that transfer some of the credit risks of the GSE's mortgage portfolios to the private sector. You can see here in table one, we've laid out how much of the US mortgage market over time has been dominated by the GSEs in absolute terms. Mm -hmm. The GSEs are limited by statute to buying uh, conforming loans. Conforming loans are high quality. They have to have a loan to value ratio of 80% or less, or they have to have credit enhancements such as private mortgage insurance. The GSEs have standardized the underwriting throughout the market. So originators have to follow underwriting that meets GSE criteria. And the GSEs were pioneers in and have continued to advance automated underwriting in the US mortgage markets. Conforming loans also have to be at or below a certain dollar amount called the conforming loan limit. There are different conforming loan limits for properties based on the number of units within a property, one, two, three, or four. And the conforming loan limit can be higher based on the area of the country. So there's a baseline conforming loan limit that applies for most of the United States. And then in high cost areas, that limit can be up to 75% higher. Table two presents the conforming loan limits over time and estimates what we expect the conforming loan limit to be in uh, 2022. Because you have a break in the market for conforming and non-conforming loans, this structure creates a natural experiment. And these the difference between uh, mortgages below the conforming loan limit and conforming mortgages and the non-conforming mortgages or jumbo mortgages above the conforming loan limit has been used in a lot of the studies to estimate various aspects of the mortgage market. The GSEs also charge uh, fees for the guarantee that they provide on the mortgage-backed security. And prior to the financial crisis, crisis the, these G fees do not vary by credit risk. But since 2008, they have varied by credit risk, although the structure is probably flatter than the underlying credit risk profile of all the mortgages. Interestingly, since December of 2020, the GSEs have also been subject to capital requirements that vary by the, cap, by the credit risk of the underlying mortgages. So in table three, we show the example of Fannie Mae's loan level pricing adjustments. As you can see, they, they vary by the loan to value ratio of the underlying mortgage and the credit score of the borrower with higher loan to value ratios and lower credit scores resulting in higher fees. The GSEs enjoy a special status. 
There's a 70 year history of this public private partnership that is fairly unique in the, the US economy. These firms are privately owned firms with a government issued uh, and a government specified charter with uh, public purposes as outlined before. Over these 70 years, five different agencies have supervised the GSEs in different ways. We've seen a cycle of crises in the housing market and the financial markets, and then legislation to respond to those crises that, that have changed the structure of both the GSEs and the supervising agencies over time. Today, the GSEs enjoy several special legal privileges. They're exempt from most state and local taxes. Their securities are exempt from SEC registration. The Federal Reserve may purchase more, uh, GSE mortgage-backed securities as part of open market operations. And within many other regulations of, of the federal government, the GSEs enjoy a special status. For example, within the bank capital rules, bank-owned exposures to the GSEs enjoy a lower risk weighting than bank-owned exposures to other private firms. Taken together, the special status um, gives a lot of financial benefits to the GSEs and has led investors to see the GSEs as implicitly guaranteed by the federal government. Investors have expected over the course of their history that if there were problems with the GSEs, the US federal government would step in. And in fact, they did. In 2008, both GSEs failed and the newly created Federal Housing Finance Agency stepped in and put both GSEs into conservatorship. At the same time, to provide capital to, the, capital to the troubled firms, the US Treasury entered into a preferred stock purchase agreement with each GSE. These PSPAs uh, established lines of credit for each firm, of which less than half has been used today and the rest is still, still available. Under the PSPAs, the Treasury received warrants to, to purchase up to 79.9% of each GSE's common stock. And Treasury has the right to consent to either GSE leaving conservatorship. As consideration for this capital support, the GSEs pay dividends to the US Treasury. And until recently, the GSEs were, were paying all of their profits to the US Treasury as dividends. As of a few years ago, the GSEs began um, retaining capital and they are currently accumulating capital up to the minimums specified in the capital rule that was issued last year. There's a body of existing research that, as I mentioned, uses the natural experiment um, created by the special status of the GSEs and by the, the discontinuity in the market around conforming loans and look at a number of questions. In the chapter, we specify um, a host of articles and their conclusions. In the interest of time, I'm just going to go through the questions really quickly, and if we have some more time, we can talk about it. But existing research, research uh, looks at what impact the GSEs have on mortgage rates, what impact the GSEs have on mortgage lending volume and especially refinancing volume. They look at why the 30 year fixed rate mortgage is predominant in the United States, how the GSEs affect consumer and, lend and lender behavior, and how, how the GSEs impact house prices, home sales, construction activity, Some researchers look at whether the GSEs play a counter cyclical role and how that translates to the market, how the GSEs affect credit avail availability in the US, and how they impact first time home buyers' access to credit. The GSEs have affordable housing goals in their, in their charters and in the regulations. There's research looking at how effective those affordable housing go goals are at actually promoting affordable housing in the United States. And interestingly, existing research looks at who benefits and who has benefited historically from the implicit guarantee.
But looking at this span of research, we realized there are many potential questions to further research in this area. For example, do the GSEs impact housing supply? As mentioned, a lot of research looks at the conforming loan limits and looks at the natural experiment um, created by conforming loans. But most of that research focuses on single unit, single family residential. The GSEs also um, have policies to support multi-unit, two, three, and four unit in particular, sing what's considered single family residential properties. Could the research that's that currently exists for single unit be extended to multi-unit? And could that area potentially um, contribute to the conversation about the housing crisis in US cities and in our suburbs? Another area to explore is what affects the G fees and the capital requirements um, that vary by credit risk have on housing finance in general. Does that translate through to mortgage rates, to housing credit availability, et cetera? Does the special legal status of the GSEs play a role in housing credit av availability? And if there are any particular aspects of that special le legal status that in particular impact housing credit availability. In the area of political economy, what is the impact of different regulatory regimes on the performance of the GSEs on, and on the wider financial and mortgage markets? Does the GSE standardization of underwriting or development of automated underwriting impact mortgage rates and housing credit availability? And interesting, it would be interesting to investigate whether these developments contributed to racial bias in mortgage rates or homeownership. And then finally, what role do GSE obligations play as safe assets as part of the money supply? This has been touched on in current research, but we think there's a lot more to be investigated there. Finally, GSE reform. This has been a hot topic for literally decades, but as the conservatorship um, drags on, it's, it often uh, is a hot topic here in Washington, DC. The current structure of the GSEs has been, as we've seen, is prone to moral hazard when it's outside of conservatorship. We identify here seven things, which I will skip over, that any GSE reform must, uh, any GSE reform proposals must face. These are difficult challenges that make it, uh, it, it make it so there isn't an easy solution to the GSE situation. The, the reform proposals that have been put out there span a large field from those proposals that discuss exiting conservatorship with little change to the legal structure, to those that advocate for full-fledged reform of the entire housing finance system, including not just the GSEs, but also the federal home loan banks and the private housing finance system. That said, there are some advantages to the status quo. The mortgage market seems to be working well, and it even seemed to work well through the pandemic. Conservatorship is starting to look like a sustainable industry structure, even though on paper it is supposed to be temporary. Reform could result in significant transitional problems that cause a lot of people concern about moving in that direction. The government guarantee, implicit or explicit, that addresses the tail risk of mortgages may be needed to provide affordable mortgage finance. And when thinking about that, the many GSE uh, reform proposals start by thinking through how the government guarantee will be addressed. Some proposals uh, envision true privatization that eliminates all guarantees through increased competition. Others envision greater limitations on GSE activities coupled with an explicit and paid for government guarantee. Still others envision, a regulated, envision the GSEs becoming regulated utilities or even go as far as government ownership. We leave you here with a quote from Ben Bernanke in, in 2008, regardless of the organizational form, we must strive to design a housing system and ensures successful funding and securitization of mortgages during times of financial stress, but that does not create institutions that pose systemic risk to our financial markets and the economy. And with that, I will turn it over to, I believe, Stefania for our 
discussion. Oh, Tom, 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 I think. Uh, oh, Tom, you excuse me. Thank <laughs> excuse you me. Thank you. You have to stop sharing, Julian, before Tom. Yeah, I'm just looking for the button. Got it. Uh, one second, I'm having some trouble sharing. Can you see my screen? Nope. Try this again. How about now? Yep, now we see it. Great. Okay, take it away. All right, so um, thanks a lot. Uh, this is a really sort of interesting collection of uh, papers, and I'm um, very thrilled to be, uh, be involved. Um, these are not official Federal Reserve positions, and I am not going to say anything uh, remotely related to monetary policy. Um, so I thought this was a very nice chapter. I, I learned quite a bit. The, the GSEs, uh, you know, this literature is something I've always wanted to know more about, and um, now I now I feel that I do. Um, so it was it was clearly written, and, and as far as I could tell, um, quite comprehensive. I, I also really appreciated that the authors uh, followed directions and and were very good about uh, pointing out places where future research would be um, possible or, or valuable. Uh, there were eight or ten places in the paper where they, they had explicit um, suggestions along those lines, and and that made me want to go out and, and write papers about GSEs. So I think that's uh, that's a good thing. Um, so I, I won't, uh, you know, Jillian did did a good job of um, of summarizing her paper. I won't I won't repeat that. I'll just make uh, a few comments um, along two lines. One, some more minor things about just where I, you know, a few places where I just wanted a little bit, a few more facts, just to some more detail uh, that I think the authors could probably include pretty easily. Um, and then I'll, I'll talk about a couple of bigger picture issues that may or may not be worth addressing in the paper. Um, so in terms of details, there, there were a few things. Um, again, I don't, I'm not, you know, I don't know uh, that there's literature that necessarily needs to be cited here, or any kind of analysis that needs to be done, but just having some kind of um, institutional details uh, on the table would have would have helped me to uh, to kind of get my head around some of the issues a little bit. So one thing is, you know, the, the paper focuses on on Fannie Mae um, and Freddie Mac. I think that's that's wise to to kind of pare down the the scope of it like that. Um, and I certainly don't think that they would want to talk about other agencies. The FHLB in particular would be an entirely different paper. But um, but it did seem like maybe there could be a little bit more information about Ginny Mae because Ginny Mae is doing something kind of similar to what Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are doing, but the, it's a different market and they're structured a bit differently. And so you know maybe just a paragraph or two um, explaining why Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are really the interesting uh, things to to look at that would have been helpful. Um, then when it came to to Fannie and Freddie in particular, I think um, it really would have gone a long way to have just maybe a snapshot of the balance sheet or income statement or something like that. So there's some information about capital positions and, and general size and things. Um, I think on the balance sheet, obviously you would see the, the big elephant is the, is the securitization piece, the pass-through piece. That, and that's not really what I wanted to, to focus on though, because I know there's other things going on there. They, they retain um, some mortgages themselves. They have kind of interesting asset liability management problems, um, liquidity <coughs> issues, excuse me. Uh, they participate, for example, they sell um, Fed funds that we know, that, and so I kind of wanted to know, you know, are there liquidity risks there, um, either for the GSEs themselves or for the Fed funds market? Um, is there any kind of dur duration uh, mismatch I should be worried about or credit risk in the, in the retained portfolio? Um, I don't need a, a huge amount of information on that again, but just, just some basic uh, details on, on how they're organized and how they're run, I think would have been, uh, would have been useful. Um, the other things, so I mean, this is the, the handbook on, uh, on financial markets. And so, it, you know, it, it, there's a couple of, of aspects of financial markets that actually would be, I think, uh, worth discussing. Um, one is the agency debt market. I, I didn't see this mentioned at all. So that, I mean, the, in addition, of course, to the, the pass-through securities, um, agents, the GSEs themselves issue bonds. Um, 
you know, I've always kind of thought of that as a, like a sleepy little corner of the of the bond market, but you know, it's it's half a trillion dollars or something like that. Uh, the Fed has bought this stuff in the past. Um, I know there's, I don't know the literature, but I know that there is some some uh, research that looks at these at these products, and and so it seemed like just a, a few uh, statistics or a nod toward that literature uh, probably would be helpful because I don't I don't think it's covered elsewhere uh, in the handbook. Um, and then what I really wanted to know more about was the credit risk transfers. And uh, this is something, I don't know, it seemed like the way the paper was written, it thought maybe it seemed like maybe you guys thought this was going to be discussed in the MBS chapter or something, but I didn't, I didn't see it there. Um, and, and I think it's worth discussing because this is, this is a new market that I, I know nothing about. I think it's not really on a lot of people's radar screens and, and just um, basic facts about how big is it? How much of the GSC portfolio does it protect? Um, how is it traded? What's the secondary market like? Who's holding it? Those kinds of things I, I think would be really interesting um, to know. All right. Bigger picture uh, questions. So um, there's two, two things I had that, that are kind of related. Uh, the first thing is, do the GSEs do anything useful? And I, so you can think about the costs and benefits of having GSEs. And I just want to take the costs off the table for a minute. Suppose there's no cost to running these GSEs. Is, you know, how big is the benefit? Is there a benefit? And I would have, you know, my prior going into this was, of course, there must be the, these guys that they have a huge footprint. They're, there's all kinds of diversification and economies of scope, and they're introducing liquidity into these markets that, that might not otherwise exist. They get preferential regulatory treatment. They get this implicit uh, government guarantee. So there must be, you know, the big, big rents here that they're passing on to, to the mortgage market. And, and, and presumably that's, that's facilitating uh, credit and, um, and hopefully promoting housing. And maybe that's, maybe that's the case, but it, that message certainly did not, did not come across to me in the way that the authors just described the literature. And I think, I don't know if I just, if I read it wrong or this was really the, the message they intended to send. Um, but it seemed like most of, this, most of the places where they talked about the effects of the GSEs on the markets, the evidence is kind of lukewarm. They're, well, there's some studies where it lowers mortgage rates, but you know, that's, that's not really a very ringing endorsement. Um, they, there's a, lot, a number of papers, uh, as Jillian mentioned, that sort of use the, the conforming uh, loan limit as a, as a, a discontinuity, but it seems like that there's no clear uh, break at that at that limit. And it might, once you control for other stuff, even go in the wrong direction. Um, there's some evidence that, you know, things work on maybe house prices, but not home ownership. It's not clear that the government guarantee is passing through to mortgage rates. And so this, I found this all sort of really surprising if that's, if, if I if I understood um, the, the thrust of this discussion correctly. And uh, if that's not what the authors intended to, to convey, maybe they want to tweak the words a little. If it is what they contended, intended to convey, then I guess the, the natural question is, why isn't this more clear cut? What's happening to these big subsidies and these economies of scope, where it's economies of scale, where are they going? Are they all just getting absorbed by shareholders or are the GSEs just so like corrupt and inefficiently run that you know, it's all just getting kind of lost in the, in the bureaucracy? Uh, both of those obviously are not the intent of, of the Congress had when they founded the GSEs. So I think um, talking about that a little bit would have, would have been interesting. Um, and then the second thing, I don't know whether this belongs at the end when they talk about GSE reform or if it belongs at the beginning when they're talking about um, kind of motivating GSEs, but, but a question that comes up is, uh, you know, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of space in the paper devoted to talking about uh, proposals for reform and how should, what is the optimal GSE structure. Um, but I think, you know, once you're kind of erase the board and, and think about how you want to do this, you have to ask the question of whether you need GSEs at all. What are they, you know, what are they really doing? And that's, um, you know, I know the people who work in this area probably have very strong views about the, the, um, the way to reform GSEs. I don't, I'm not knowledgeable about this, so I don't have a strong view. This is a genuine question. It's not a, it's not a rhetorical question. Um, it seems like, you know, the, the, the policy objective here is to support the housing market and in particular, the low income sector of the housing market. And it's, it, it wouldn't be appropriate for the, the paper to ask whether that's a worthy policy objective. I think you, you take that as given. But the question is, if that's the objective, what's the most efficient way of accomplishing that objective? And to answer that question, you have to sort of think about what are the market failures that require a government intervention here in the first place? So you can think about externalities you know, associated with home ownership. You can think about maybe um, information problems in the, in the mortgage market that, that prevent it from, from operating efficiently. If those are the things that you're worried about, 
Um, why not, you know, wouldn't it be more sort of efficient and direct just to give people money to, to take out mortgages? The government already does that, you know, through tax subsidies and other programs, but maybe you could do more, maybe you could do it differently, or you could guarantee loans in other ways, you know, the um, uh, Small Business Administration, excuse me, um, directly guarantees loans. You have, uh, you know, again, Ginnie Mae type programs that, that guarantee MBS in a different way than the, than the um, uh, government sponsored enterprises do. Uh, so it just, I don't know if this is beyond the scope of the paper or not, but it's, um, it, it's sort of interesting to think about, you know, why, why the GSE structure exists at all, whether it's an efficient way of dealing with the problem. Why do you need two GSEs doing essentially the same thing? You know, all of those kinds of questions seem like they should be on the table if we're, if we're thinking about reform. Um, and then the final thing I'll mention, you know, in talking again about, the, about the market failure here, this is, this is one thing that the authors, I mentioned kind of buried toward toward the end of the paper um, that I thought was really the, interesting. It suggests that um, you can distribute the expected credit credit losses through the private market, but then you have this really this big tail risk, a sort of a systemic risk uh, that would require a really large uh, risk premium in order to for the market to bear. And that's that's kind of the reason that the secondary market breaks down and that you need government support. Um, so that's a different type of market failure that, that could um, justify something like a GSE program. But what's interesting about that, of course, is that if that's the if that's the failure you're worried about, you know, the solution to that is not to ensure every single loss on every single mortgage. It's just to ensure the tail risk. Right? You don't you don't take out insurance against everyday losses. You only take out insurance against catastrophic losses. Um, and that's a much different sort of program uh, than, than the program the GSEs, I think, are, are currently running. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what it would look like to only insure tail risk, but it seems like it would be a much smaller and sort of differently run um, uh, program. Uh, so anyway, again, and some of this stuff might be, might be well beyond the scope of the paper, but I, it does seem like it's, um, it's worth asking a little bit of these bigger picture uh, things. Um, that's all I had. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for a quick question. Well, if not, uh, do Gillian, Wayne, or Shane have anything to say? Uh, um, I think I think Wayne drew the short straw of responding. So, <laughs> yeah. So it was just I don't know. Can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. Okay, great. I, I'm just going to just uh, thank Tom for the remarks. I think they're right on the mark. Uh, I think covering Ginny May and agency debt is a good idea. Try to put at least a little bit in there. It's just a question of length. Uh, and then uh, the CRTs will work it out with the uh, James and the other authors to make sure they do get covered. I think that's their intent to have more on them. Um, I think your assessment that the Empirical literature is lukewarm about the benefits, uh, is uh, an accurate description of the research, which is, you know, the, which, we, which is what we're trying to do, give an accurate description of the research that's available. Um, and I think the question about uh, do we need GSEs is, I think we sort of view that as sort of outside the scope of the chapter, the chapter is to inform somebody about what exists, but um, you know, some of the research articles do actually uh, tackle that question. So, um, uh, so really appreciate the comments and, you know, we look forward to uh, responding to them and revising the chapter. Thank you very much, Wayne. And so that concludes our program for today. Uh, I'd like to thank the authors and discussants for all their work and uh, for starting to put together a great handbook chapter and a great conference so far. And we start up again tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock US time, which is three o'clock Central European time. Uh, I'm going to stay on the Zoom channel for a few minutes for anyone who just wants to chat. But otherwise, um, thank you again and see you tomorrow. And tomorrow will be a slightly shorter day. And tomorrow will be a slightly shorter day.